For those of you who have been uh, to Wood at Work in the past, this may sound familiar. This is called Essay on Wood by James Richardson. At dawn, when rowboats drum on the dock and every door in the breathing house bumps softly, as if someone were leaving quietly, I wonder if something in, in us is made of wood. Maybe not quite the heart knocking softly, or maybe not made of it, but made for its call. Of all the elements, it is happiest in our houses. It will sit with us, eat with us, lie down, and hold our books, themselves a rustling woods, bearing our floors and roofs without weariness. For unlike us, it does not resent its faithfulness or question why, for what, how long. Its branches have slowed the invisible feelings of light into vortices smooth for our hands, so that every fine grain handle and page and beam is a woodward, a standing wave. Years that never pass, vast, vastness never empty, speed so great it cannot be told from peace. That uh, uh, poem was published in The New Yorker about uh, five years ago, and to me it just captured so beautifully um, what we're here to talk about today. Um, I'm Scott Francisco, co-founder of Wood at Work. I'm so thrilled that you guys are all here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, two movies that have come out in the last five years that everyone should watch. The Martian and Gravity. These are two sci-fi films. If you can afford the time, watch them back to back. The message of both of these science fiction movies, intended or not, is that we live on an incredible planet, an astounding planet, an impossible planet, a planet unique beyond anything we know or can even imagine. Unlike everything we know about outer space, Earth is thriving with life and diversity and plenty. Life that still confounds the imagination and science. From the perspective of science or science fiction, we find our, find our earthly creatures, our monsters, our flowers and our trees are more awe-inspiring than any from our imagination. Truly, when we look closely or from outer space, we are equally amazed and humbled by the extravagance, the fragility and the resilience we find. After thousands and thousands of years of practice and research, we're still babies in understanding the depths and richness and complexities of life on this planet. If this were not enough, amidst the sheer bounty and beauty we find, hidden messages, invitations to use and invent, a kind of secret code, follow me, use me, together, nature whispers, we can do this, invent, harness, reconfigure, to co-create a new destiny. How extraordinary we are partners in the becoming of this planet. And then we're confronted by our past, our legacy. Rather than partnerships and stewardship, we've too often depleted the stores. We've consumed without reverence, without thanksgiving, and without even planting. We've ignored the pleas of the vulnerable and signs of distress. Rather than partner with nature, we've enslaved it, ignored its agency, its interconnectedness, and its intrinsic value. Between these two coexisting truths of Beauty, bounty, and exploitation stands the forest. Witness to our troubled and sometimes misguided past, yet still offering itself to us as a place of refuge, fertility, food to eat, materials to build with, to build a new and better world, and a way to heal the atmosphere we've thrown out of balance. Every second, the forest grows, with or without our help, and still calls us into partnership. It calls us to participate, to call, to weed, to plant, to understand, to learn, it calls us to take timber and to leave it alone, to give it time and space, long time and big space, as a famous forester has said that will be mentioned later today, to grant its creatures the first fruits of the freedom of the forest, dappled light and places to hide, nest and play. At work and play in the forest is the most natural place for humans to be. Human history is a history built of wood, there is not a culture anywhere or at any time that does not dwell but by the gift of wood. 
Um, just think about that. To make our way in the world, our houses, our boats, our fires, our tools of every kind. Today, science and our spirits tell us that our dwelling on Earth demands not just invention and innovation, but restoration. And again, the forest invites us. So perhaps restoration is more of a partnership than we think. Uh, restore ourselves and restore the forest. Which comes first? So these are some of the things that we're going to explore today. As part of this, um, I want to acknowledge the land that the university is, is on here. We'd like to acknowledge, on behalf of the University of Toronto, um, the sacred land on which this university operates. It has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Patoon First Nations and the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today the, today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. So I also want to thank, I just want to thank you for coming here. Um, there's a lot of people that have worked hard to make this event happen. Um, special thanks to Dr. Sarah Wilson, a co-founder of Wood at Work, and also my wife, um, and also an esteemed forest ecologist and geographer. Um, I want to thank our sponsors who've made this happen, uh, have taken a very special interest to make this happen. Uh, our Walnut sponsors, the Carpenters Union Local 27, Woodworks Ontario, the Mass Timber Institute of Ontario, our Cedar sponsors, the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design, um, who were generous to let us use their building, uh, the Faculty of Forestry at University of Toronto, Woodmiser Canada, hopefully you'll all be able to partake in the demonstration of the sawmill outside and check that out at the coffee break. Um, EACOM, Forest Ontario, um, and also we'd like to thank Structure Fusion, HDR, and Radiant City Millwork. Um, in case you didn't notice it coming in, there's a, a structural model um, in this uh, eastern part of the lobby of one of the buildings that will be presented later today uh, that students from the university and some of the architecture firms have collaborated on. So, um, I think without too much further ado, I'm going to call Liet Margolis to lead us in the first panel. Um, that is Urban Environments Built and Grown. And if the panelists uh, would like to come forward and have a seat, and Liet, um, love you to introduce them and take it away. Good morning. Uh, my name is Leah Margolis, uh, and I'm the uh, Associate Dean of Research here at the Daniels Faculty, and also the Director of the Master of Landscape Architecture Program. I'm very pleased to, uh, to be, take part of this uh, symposium uh, and to foreground the discussion on urban forestry, on wood-based practices, and uh, socio-technical uh, environmental implications at local, regional, and transnational scales. Our panelists this morning represent a diverse set of perspectives and practices. On one end, uh, wood as a living and functioning plant within a managed eco ecological system. On the other, wood as material, cultivated, harvested, transported, manufactured, inhabited. Just this past Tuesday, I co-hosted a, um, a panel discussion with the uh, Toronto City Planning. Uh, to discuss the Toronto's uh, draft biodiversity strategy and its ambition to frame the terms and values by which we define, protect, and enhance biodiversities, uh, biodiversity in cities. On November 6th, our faculty will host C40, 
the city's climate leadership group, which connects 90 of the world's greatest cities, representing more than 650 million people and one quarter of the global economy, to mobilize action on climate change. So this symposium today and this morning's panel, Urban Environments Built and Grown, uh, in my mind is an important extension of these dialogues here at the faculty. Uh, as many cities and policy leaders on climate change uh, have recently em embraced incorporating natural processes or quote unquote green infrastructure in urban planning and design and have begun to look uh, to the field of landscape architecture as the integrator between environmental science, engineering and planning, creating place-based environmental solutions that are also uh, socially engaging and culturally relevant. As noted by evolutionary ecology professor Mark Johnson, who was part of the panel on Tuesday, uh, quote, we're living in a time of unprecedented urbanization where more than half of the world's human population now resides in urban areas. Urban areas comprise an increasingly proportion, an increasing proportion of Earth's land surface. On a local scale, urbanization has resulted in conversion of natural areas into built impervious areas that has lost and fragmented habitat and degraded ecological functioning. On a global scale, cities are the central drivers of climate change and the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. The Toronto Biodiversity Report states that uh, the United Nations 2005 Millennium Ecosystem Assessment completed a comprehensive review that determined that ecosystems and human well-being are inextricably interrelated. We depend on healthy forest cover and wetland to manage stormwater flows to help clean water. Forests help regulate climate and mitigate against climate change by absorbing solar radiation and acting as carbon sinks. A healthy forest also supports oxygen production and air purification. The other important piece here is that cities and metropolitan regions is where the most exciting action is on climate change, environment and sustainability. And our speakers um, will attest to that, I think. I want to cite just a few uh, examples here in the GTA. Uh, dubbed a city within a park, Toronto's natural heritage system, thanks to the work of the Toronto Region and Conservation Authority, uh, or TRCA, uh, since 1954 contains almost 11,000 hectares, equal to 17% of the city's total land area. A couple of years ago, with over 10 million trees across public and private lands, TD Bank estimated the value of Toronto's urban forest to be $80 million annually in ecosystem services, stormwater management, erosion control, energy savings, and improved air quality. Zooming back out into the region, the Ontario 2005 Greenbelt Act by the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, Ministry of Housing, ensures the protection of an area spanning nearly 2 million acres, one of the largest in the world, permanently protecting farmland, water supplies, and air purifying forests from urban sprawl. The Greenbelt's economic contribution to Ontario is estimated at over $9, $9 billion annually as it anchors the region's agriculture, tourism, and recreation industry. In 2013, City Council adopted a motion requesting Toronto Water Transportation Services, Engineering and Construction Services city plan and City Planning to develop green infrastructure standards. With 5,400 uh, hectares of roadway in the City of Toronto, the pollutant concentration in stormwater runoff generated by the city's system roads are estimated to be 12,000% <coughs> greater than the province of Ontario water quality objective. Uh, right in the last few years, Toronto Lakefront is now lined with structural suspended pavement system planted with nearly 7,000 trees and manages 90% stormwater in 850 hectare of urban redevelopment. Um, as some of my colleagues in the city and TRCA say, the real crux of implementation though um, is in the partitioning of municipal governments into silos 
It's a new way of doing business. It's going to require a new effort and new organizational approaches that are very multidisciplinary, multi interdivisional, and cross-jurisdictional because we're talking about now what that watersheds and ecosystems that cross over political boundaries. So as our speakers uh, this morning will tell us, uh, forests and ecosystems, whether wild, constructed, or managed, are products of historic and contemporary interactions between humans and their environment, which ultimately shape um, the social, infrastructural, and environmental conditions of cities. And now, uh, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Our, our first speaker is Bram Gunter. Uh, he's the co-director of the Urban uh, Field Station, a partnership with the U.S. Forest Service and Natural Areas Conservancy, which is the science hub of forestry, horticulture, and natural resources of New York City's Park Department. Uh, uh, next up will be uh, Ray Vendrig uh, and Amory uh, Neng. Sorry about that. Um, Ray is an acting manager in urban forest renewal in the urban forestry department at the city of Toronto. Uh, and Amory is a project manager also with the forest, uh, with the urban forestry at the city. Uh, next up, uh, Paul Fuge uh, has been involved with forest and wood manufacturing for uh, 45 years. And as a board member of the, and chairman of the board of the US-based Certified Forest Products Council, he worked to foster awareness of Forest Stewardship Council, uh, also known as FSC certification as, and to facilitate trade in FSC lumber uh, and finished products in the Americas. Last but not least, Jane Hutton is an assistant professor of landscape architecture in the Department of Architecture at the University of Waterloo. Her research looks at materials and material practices in design, mapping the histories, sources, and sites of common building materials. Uh, so thank you for joining us this morning, and I invite uh, uh, Bram to uh, join us uh, at the stage. Uh, thank you. Um, I will try to be within time. <laughs> um, and I want to just point out that Amory used to work for me when I was the chief of forestry in New York City, so it's really nice to see him here doing forestry here in this great city. Um, and before I start, just following on Scott's introduction, which was literary or artistic, there is a new book out called The Overstory by Richard Powers, um, which is, you have to commit to it. It's a big read but it is incredible, and the narrator in the book refers to trees as the planet's greatest invention. Um, okay, so uh, this is the Bronx River. It is the last remaining freshwater river in New York City. It is, the city did a lot of work to clean it up, but it would not stay clean without the forest on either side of it. This is, I hope you can see it, it is a rendering of Manhattan in 1609 from Eric Sanderson's book, Manhattan. And I always start with this. Uh, in part, I don't suspect this crowd, but I speak a lot in front of people, and people tend to forget that the city is superimposed on nature. They always think it's the other way around. But not that long ago, this is what Manhattan looked like. If you look all the way to the left, uh, your, yes, your left, that is the half moon sailing up the Hudson River. But the city has been vastly developed. I don't need to explain that to you, but we have some really beautiful remnant forests left that I'm just going to show two slides of. This is Van Cortlandt Park in the Bronx. Um, most people associate the Bronx with urban blight, but one of our healthiest forests is there. And that's just a wonderful picture of it. And so was another picture here of Cunningham Park in Queens. So the Natural Areas Conservancy, I wear two hats. I work for the New York City Parks Department. I've had many positions over my 27 years for the agency. Uh, and six years ago, I co-founded the Natural Areas Conservancy. Uh, and I co-founded it when I was the chief of the division, um, primarily because as chief, and thinking about how to manage our natural resources in New York City, I realized that there was an underinvestment in 
uh, the city's willingness and financial commitment to manage these spaces. So in a long tradition in New York City, starting with the Central Park Conservancy, was, which is the most famous version of this, I started a public-private partnership. And what public-private partnerships do, at least in New York City, I don't want to generalize, is allow, fill a gap in the city's resource management, raising more, more nimbly raising money, increasing the expertise, increasing the resources that go to this uh, asset. And what also makes us special, as you can see from this slide, is that the traditional New York City Conservancy is focused on an individual park. The Natural Areas Conservancy was the first conservancy to be focused citywide on natural areas from the southern tip of Staten Island, which is where the Mid-Atlantic starts, to the tip of the Bronx, which is where the New England ends or starts, depending upon your perspective. So you can see the range, and there are 20,000 acres of natural areas, forests and wetlands in New York City. That includes New York City Parks Department, National Park Service, state parks. And within New York City parks, there's 10,000 acres of forest and wetlands. So here's a breakdown of New York City. This is important to show, um, partly because, um, you know, obviously New York City is and is known as a concrete jungle, but it turns out that about 40% of the city is open green space. That is backyards, that is college campuses, that is cemeteries, those are green roofs, and within, as a subset of that, uh, you can see the breakdown of natural areas. And again, I'm including everything citywide, not, ju not just New York City Parks Department, the forests, the grasslands, and the wetlands. So we actually have more than one would think, and these places are critically important. So when the Natural Areas Conservancy started out, we started out by asking ourselves these, uh, these questions. What are the conditions and distribution of nature in New York City? How are New, York, New Yorkers experiencing nature? How should we improve degraded forests and wetlands? Um, how can we ensure, uh, that, uh, sorry, ensure that natural areas are resilient to climate change? And as a result of those questions, the first two years of our existence, we did an incredibly comprehensive ecological assessment of the 10,000 acres of the New York City Parks Department's forest and wetlands. We have since branched out and have done that ecological assessment on National Park Service and state land, but it started just on New York City, uh, New York City land, uh, New York City Parks land, and we hired 25 young urban ecologists for over two seasons to collect this compre comprehensive data. So we collected the data, we started looking at it, and the first thing that we were able to do was produce a matrix of the ecological health and threats, <coughs> excuse me, of every single patch of forest within the city. And you can see down here the scatter plot, any patch of forest or an entire forest can fall on that, um, on that graph. And you can see high health, low threat. It's easier to read up here than down here, unless I put on my glasses. Um, and so for us, and as you think about this in relation to us making management decisions, this is critically important. So there might be a site that is really high ecological value, but under a lot of threat, so we might choose to work there. There might be a site that's particularly important to a neighborhood or stewardship group. That might, might be our motivating factor. So other data that started to come from the analysis of this initial uh, data was that New York City's forests, our canopy, are surprisingly healthy. We found that 85% of the canopy in these forests across the city represent uh, what a healthy forest, that first picture I showed you, the rendering of Manahatta, there obviously it's not the same composition of species, but a re relatively healthy, robust, robust forest. But the understory is 48% native. So if your measurement gauge of ecological health is in part native species, you can see that we're, the future generations of trees are facing a threat 
And as managers, we need to think about what that means and how we spend our money and uh, how we use our resources. So another thing that resulted from this ecological assessment and that has led to my next slide um, is a very precise way of categorizing how much it costs it to work in any specific area of forest and what kind of practice, whether we work with a contractor, which is most expensive, whether it's in-house crews, whether we're working, working with stewards in the neighborhood. Um, so I'm not going to get into each one of these figures, but, sorry, hold on, I'm going to skip for a second, and I'll come back to the social slide. So ultimately, this yielded what we call the Forest Management Framework, which is a vision for the long-term health of the forests of New York City. And we know the exact dollar amount, the exact ecological health based upon the data that we collected, the threats of every single patch of forest across the city. So what we want is biological health, comprehensive management of all these spaces, and that these spaces are obviously, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, available for healthy recreation, volunteerism, and green jobs. So goal, 100% active, which requires 385 million over 25 years. It sounds like a lot, but it's nothing. Just to redo 10 blocks of streets in New York City in one year is probably about $500 million. So we did not forget, uh, as we should not, the social side of this. So as we did the ecological assessment, there was an associated and complementary work by our partners at the U.S. Forest Service interviewing over 1,600 people in over 40 parks on the values, perspective, and behavior of these people around natural areas. So one of the, some of the things that we discovered, well-managed forests are more welcoming. That's, of course, intuitive, but that's really important for management because, obviously, if we have not worked on a forest, um, people might not go and use it. Members of stewardship groups are more likely to visit natural areas. Um, parks provide well-being. Local conservation leads to national and global conservation. Um, and I went over this before. So this, the work on the forest management, five minutes, thank you, the work on the forest management framework led to us thinking about and wondering what other cities in the United States are doing to manage their forests. And that led to a grant for us to be able to, through working with the Trust for Public Land, which I'm going to assume most of you have heard of, we, they develop each year, they kind of come out with a report card or a scorecard of parks in cities, the 100 largest cities across America. We started looking at the appendices, which sometimes have the most useful information, and we realized that a lot of the parkland in these cities are natural areas. And what it turns out is that, let's see, do I have the numbers? 1.7 million acres combined in the 100 and 25 cities that responded to this survey are natural areas. Think about that, 1.7 million combined. The largest areas in parkland in all of these cities are actually wild forests or wetlands, not the standard landscape park that most people use. So we took that information and we started uh, analyzing it and thinking about it and what came of that survey 80, of course, 82% of North Americans live in urban areas. 50% of New Yorkers never recreate outside of New York City parks. So think about the implications for the people in the city and how we need to manage these spaces. Well-managed forests, we already talked about that, but I just want to, I'm going fast, I know that, but I want to emphasize that these natural areas, which are one-third of the Parks Department's portfolio, Parks manages 30,000 acres, 10,000 acres are natural areas, are by far the most underused parts of the Parks Department. Yet they make up a third. So as the city grows, as we face climate change, if we do not leverage this resource, it is a waste. Um, national survey. 
Who is managing forested parklands across the US? What management interventions are they using? How do they measure success? What challenges do they face? Um, 125 organizations responded, 111 cities representing 40 states. We had no idea. In fact, when we were trying to predict the response we would get, we thought maybe 10 or 15 cities would respond. So it shows you how hungry managers are in these cities to talk about it, to hear from other cities and what they're doing. Who participated? 67% municipal government, 16% nonprofit, 8% state or federal government, 60% of the organizations have worked in forested natural areas over 20 years. Why are cities investing in natural areas? 44% uh, to restore and enhance and protect their natural resources, 40% enhance quality of life for city residents, 25% community engagement and stewardship, 22% sustained for future generations, 21% improve awareness of natural resources. These slides I'm going to gloss over. We don't have time to analyze them, but Scott can send out this uh, PowerPoint to anybody who's interested in it. It is worth, if you are interested in what I'm talking about, it is worth looking at this slide. This is what ecological data are cities actually using and collecting. And this slide is what social data are cities using and collecting. They do go together. They cannot be separated. OK. I've got a minute left. Opportunities. Forest management is a climate solution. Expand trails and access. This is the social part. Biggest concentrations of nature are the most unused, the least invested in, and in part because people are scared to go in there. Good trails with good signage, with good entrances are going to bring people in. Strengthen connection to public health, increase visibility, expand funding for natural areas management, and bridge science and practice, which is very much what the Natural Areas Conservancy is about. Stay tuned. Next year, a report will be released. Next year, we're going to be convening. Perhaps Toronto can join us. Uh, 2019 Core City Case Studies. And here is the segue and the City Forest Forest. I don't know if everyone in the room knows, but this is a new initiative, an incredible initiative, through Scott, through pi, uh, pilot projects. And it is very similar and parallel to what we've just done in our national survey. And that is bringing, in this case, international cities together for the same similar reasons. What are they doing? What are their practices? How can their practices improve? How can we establish a network to share practices, to share information? Collective action always gives a stronger voice to whatever you're advocating for. And in this case, of course, urban forests. Here's another slide showing how important this is as it relates to sustainability. Here, lastly, is a list. And I want to point out that New York City is an initial signatory, not only the Natural Areas Conservancy, but the mayor's office has signed off on this too. So we are a double signature to this. And that's where I am. Stay in touch. <laughs>
trees on streets and 3.5 million trees in our parks and ravine systems. So the City of Toronto's urban forestry budget uh, is about $68.7 million, so that's before our capital budget. And so um, by Canadian municipality standards, we have quite a sizable operation, and I don't think there are many municipalities in Canada that has the same sort of breadth and scope that we have. Um, the structure of urban forestry at the City of Toronto is unique. You'll find urban forestry uh, departments or teams are often organized quite differently across the country. Uh, here at the City of Toronto, we are vertically integrated in terms of all forestry functions fall under our director of urban forestry, Jason Doyle. Um, and we have five sort of business areas um, that reflects the different priorities and challenges that we face. We have our forestry operations uh, section. We have two managers of forestry operations splitting the city in east and west. Under each of them, we have various operating yards, uh, and that includes our contracted services. So <coughs> part of the city's arboricultural services are done in-house, and part of them are done through contracted crews. And quite interestingly for the City of Toronto, we actually have a dedicated yard, an operations section that looks after what we deem as commercial trees or trees in hardscapes and hard surfaces. So they work quite closely with a lot of projects like Waterfront Toronto um, and with a lot of new capital developments in the public realm. Um, urban forest renewal section, um, of which uh, my boss Ray is the manager of, is responsible for all tree planting and streetscapes. Um, so that includes tree planting and unwritten nursery. We have a natural environment and community program section that works out of the Evergreen Brickworks and does a lot of great stewardship work in the ravines natural areas. And then we have our tree planting strategy section that I'm responsible for. We have a forest natural area management section that is a very, very new section here at the city that's dedicated towards managing our natural areas, so we ravines. This group is responsible for things like the high park prescribed burn. So we have some oak savanna habitats and the city of Toronto has been conducting prescribed burns for a great many years there. And we also have our forest health care section that's responsible for things like gypsy moth sprays, but also for things like Asian longhorn beetle, emerald ash borer, and some of the upcoming health threats as well. And then we have our tree protection plan review section that administers our bylaws. So quite unique in Toronto is that we have a very strong legislative protection for trees on public lands, but also for trees on private lands as well. And so just to touch a bit about that, um, our urban forestry section has a proactive maintenance cycle. And so we manage on a seven year cycle and we have a program called area street tree maintenance on top of our standard um, uh, response-based pruning programs. We have a newly planted tree program, so that's to prune newly planted young trees that are done in-house. Um, and of course, like I mentioned before, we have actually a specialized team that looks after trees and maintaining and managing trees in hard services. So that's our commercial tree section. Um, development review and protection was, um, is quite a big priority here at the city, and that was actually where I started off in New York. And I think a lot of the challenges we see are quite similar in very rapidly urbanizing and developing municipalities. Um, we have uh, quite a large section across the city of Toronto, four district offices, including a centralized unit. So we do everything from issuing permits, plan reviews, and dedicated bylaw enforcement. We also have a heritage tree protection provisions within our bylaws as well. And so we have quite a range of protection available, very much to keep up with the urban development and growth that we're seeing here in Toronto. Um, I'd like to spend a few moments just to touch on our ravine and natural feature protection bylaws. So this is um, one of the very strong bylaws that we have here at the City of Toronto, specifically to protect um, our ravines and natural features. And so this covers both lands on public lands and private lands as well. And under this ravine natural features protection bylaw, all trees and vegetation are protected. And so um, there's quite a lot of work that goes into that and this is, plays a very big part in protecting a lot of these crucial natural areas. Our policy and planning section is a dedicated session that looks after uh, research and studies like our tree canopy study, developing policies, standards, key performance indicators. And one of the interesting functions, we also have our own data management center. So the 311 tier two system is actually run by forestry and forestry staff. So the next piece, and this is some of the specifications that our team works on, I'll hand over the podium to my manager who will speak about our urban forest renewal and natural areas management programs. 
Okay, thank you, Amory. Um, I'll just say very quickly, Amory and I are here until lunchtime, so I know we're limited in time to speak this morning. If you have any questions, please feel free to talk to us after. Um, so I'm going to speak very quickly about the section that I manage, which is urban forest renewal. I'll also touch on the forest and natural area management that we do in the city because I used to manage that section as well. Um, so as Amory said, I'm in charge of tree planting and community programming for the city. Um, on average, we plant approximately 120,000 trees and shrubs on public land in the city annually. And you can see the breakdown. Um, the majority of it is natural, what we call naturalization planting. So those are trees and shrubs that we plant in orphan spaces, in some of the natural areas in the parks and in the ravine systems. We also have a unit that is dedicated to doing um, community programming work. So we work with the school boards in the city. We also work with um, volunteers and we work with corporate groups to engage people in tree planting events um, and also to manage some of the natural areas on a very, very small scale. Um, and just those are some of the numbers. You know, last year we engaged over close to 4,000 volunteers through our stewardship programs. Um, tree planting. A lot of it, again, is um, naturalization planting. We also plant in parks along arterial roads. Um, in the city, we have a policy on the right of way and in residential areas, if a tree comes down, if it's a city owned tree, then it has to be replaced on a one to one basis. Uh, and that's the residential tree planting program. Uh, as I'm sure everybody's aware, most municipalities have gone through the Emerald Ash Bore and so we have had a very rigorous or vigorous program to replace all the ash trees that have been removed. In terms of natural area management, um, so we do have a, uh, a small group that manages the natural areas within the city. Um, probably one of the big, biggest programs that we have is the management of the Black Oak Savannah in Hyde Park. And one of the things one of the um, silvicultural prescriptions that we do in High Park as part of our management program is the uh, prescribed burn. And that's pretty much an annual event um, based on our analysis of um, the areas within the park. These are just some of the slides. And you know this goes along with what Bram was talking about um, in terms of engagement. Um, we host tree planting events every year. We invite communities, uh, school groups. We also have a, um, a trail building program in the city. And that's the slide on the left. Um, we manage a lot of natural surface trails in association, cooperation with the uh, local mountain bike community. And so we do have a very good volunteer participation in that, um, in that area as well. And again, just some more slides of us engaging members of the public. Um, again, some of the challenges that we face, like every other municipality, um, incredible demand on the park system and the natural areas, climate change, um, dealing with invasive species, and also the pressures related to urban development. And just a few shots, um, some areas before and after. EAB. Some of the forest health care threats that you know we're dealing with. Um, again, Asian or gypsy moth, um, beach bark disease, oak wilt is something, it's not here, but it is something, oops, sorry. Um, it is something that we are aware of and we are preparing for. And currently we do have a tree canopy of between 26 and 28 percent. Um, our goal is to get that canopy to 40 percent. We are doing a canopy analysis right now um, and we're hoping to release that report sometime early next year. And one of the major things, and I'll just touch on this very, very briefly, I know I'm out of time, but one of the things that we are doing is we are 
We do have a partnership with a foundation and we are trying to engage the private sector into planting more trees on public land because in the city, 60% of the land base is privately owned and it's our objective to um, fund private programs to increase the tree planting on private land. And the, sorry, the name of the foundation that we are working with is the Toronto Parks and Trees Foundation. That's it. Thank you very much. So it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate all the efforts that everyone makes here to um, maintain biodiversity in the world's forests. And uh, I especially appreciate uh, Scott and Sarah's dedication to this concept, uh, which works so well. And uh, I'm going to talk about a little piece of it. And, um, I'm going to be reading from my uh, a presentation due to the tardiness of my preparation of it, but I think it'll come off okay. So, uh, to begin, uh, the species complexity and landscape architectural planting specifications, and that's often a sheet of drawings, uh, on a typical set of project drawings is a celebration of the beauty of the natural world, even when translated and transplanted into urban parks, rooftop gardens, or streetscapes. All of the specified plants originated from wild forests and fields by avid collectors at some point recently or centuries ago. Landscape architects in particular are trained in the scientific names and care requirements of what they specify. The species are carefully chosen for desirable characteristics that range from awesome beauty to hardiness and drought resistance. The landscape plantings are called upon to provide wind protection and forage for birds uh, and food for pollinating insects and a relaxing environment for contemplation and partying. Natural ecosystems share these characteristics but on a vastly more complicated scale and do so in a manner so amazingly efficient and bewilderingly complex that it makes even the most arrogant human being humble. If a building or a park project is carefully designed with many thoughtfully chosen species, then a similar educated attention should be applied to the choice of wood species used in the manufacture of the structures, fixtures, and furnishings. This idea is a simple matter of respect for natural forest and common sense. Look at the building material specification sheets of the same landscape drawings, the architectural drawings, and finally the project material specification, and you will see a list of one or two species. And then compare that to the incredible and nearly incomprehensible complexity of natural ecosystems. Even the artificial diversity in designed living gardens disappears into one species for the specified exterior wood and one or a few for the interior wood choices. So where does the connection to biodiversity break down and simplify into one or a few species for products made for wood in the built environment? A highly capable wooden ship built in, in the 18th century would have used many different species of wood for various function. The same with barns, homes, kitchens, and factories. Of course, one can argue that there are many uh, much better alternative materials available for analogous functions today, but in modern landscape architect uh, furnishings and hardscape, the alternatives tend and trend toward plastic. This is near zero complexity in the actual construction materials and frequently non-forest-based substitutions. Forest certification schemes 
naturalists, biologists, nature conservation organizations, and government programs address biodiversity and conservation based on scientific observation and policy goals. The efforts of these organizations and many similar actors and programs offer promise for the incorporation of environmental and ecological values into the built environment. But this potential remains mostly inspirational and frequently does not survive the gauntlet of timber harvesting, manufacturing, distribution, and finally, the construction industry. One pinch point that needs to be examined is the construction industry CSI Division 6, which is wood, plastics, and composites. The Construction Specification Institute was founded in 1948, and its categories are very widely used to describe specific wood species and, of course, other material characteristics to be used on projects. CSI specifications carry the force of law and as such are powerful tools for defining what wood products are actually used in construction and demanded from the wood products industry, influencing what gets determined, uh, uh, influencing what gets specified determines what wood species are used and where. Separate line item requirements for certification schemes, which appear frequently in specifications, offer the illusion of a more inclusive and ecologically positive basket of wood species that reflects natural forest realities. But if the actual materials specified are mahogany or ipe or teak or any other knee-jerk over-specified species, that is what will be bought. Certification language can be removed and often is removed as the projects move forward to, toward, and I'm going to say, the chaos of completion. At that point of removal, the redlining of the certification requirements, the dreams of better ecological outcomes die. What I'm advocating is a broad effort that makes the CSI wood material specification much more technically competent and more broadly based on the specific characteristics of natural forest wood species, much like specifying particular stainless steel or aluminum alloys to purpose, keyed to purpose. Another pinch port, a pinch point, at least in North America, is the general lack of education about wood species characteristics. This problem needs to be addressed at the university level and through trade education programs that are more ecologically interesting, so, so that more ecologically interesting fixtures and furnishings can adorn the built environment. If you take apart a 19th century piece of furniture or simply examine it closely, you will find more often than not several species that are used quite specifically to purpose. And they are also aligned with the species that were available in the contemporaneous local forest. In this modern era of global wood transportation and ground up tree fragments glued together, this notion of connection of function and forest seems quaint but as an anchor for thinking about how to link city and forest and forest and city, this example is instructive. The notion is that when one thinks about the whole process from forest right through to architectural fixture and furnishing, at the same time, then benefits can flow in both directions. Just as culinary recipes are carefully, uh, are carefully uh, uh, created about ingredient lists to control and enhance outcomes, sophisticated project design should involve an examination of the performance characteristics of multiple capable wood species available, especially from natural forest. Just as designing a modern arc, arc, uh, aircraft would be just with one just, I'm sorry, uh, just as designing a modern aircraft with one, just one metal would be unthinkable, the design of landscape furnishings, screen walls, decks, and hardscapes should celebrate and support forest diversity. So what resources are available to assist specifiers, owners, and contractors as they embrace a closer relationship between forest and wooden buildings? There's a website called www.lesserknowntimberspecies.com that's worth a visit. Their efforts by the World Wildlife Fund, GFTN. Uh, all are worthy of st a study in depth for more information about and, and examples about built projects that utilize a range of species. 
The res these resources are part of the solution and critical to education awareness, but they must penetrate into the classroom in a formal way with courses and degrees given. They must ultimately influence wood specifiers to write architectural CSI language that carries the force of law. And this last mile is difficult for nonprofit organizations because their funding structures and organizational restrictions, not to mention their disclaimers about the veracity of their advice and desire to avoid liability. I quote the lesser known species website, FSE Denmark or any other mentioned organization cannot be held responsible for any consequences such as legality issues concerning trade or forest management product failure, or other damage arising from the use of information in this website. Those are all the things that contractors and owners and, and lawyers and so on have to pay attention to in the big uh, built environment. So it is up to forest owners, timber suppliers, architects, manufacturers, building owners, general contractors, and subcontractors to shoulder this responsibility designing safe, profitable, long life cycle, and technically competent products that reach back into the forest. Together we can make cities more livable and retain forest ecosystems. Do I have 30 seconds? Okay, I have something in my pocket. I just, I just, uh, I, I built a wooden house, a uh, private house that I lived in for a while, raised my kids in, in Connecticut. And there was a, a second story porch uh, and it was made of white oak, red oak, uh, and, uh, and cherry. And uh, the, the, the red oak rotted within 25 years. The white oak is okay, but it, mm, you know, it's, it's definitely rotted. The, right, the, 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 the red oak rail, uh, the white oak railing is a bit rotted, but this cherry piece in my hand was used for the verticals, uh, you know, structurally supporting the, uh, this 14 foot span of railing. And it was exposed for 44 years to New England, snow, rain, wind, weather, sun, everything, and it looks great. This is a typical grade piece of wood. If I look at the ends, I suspect there's probably five thousandths, six thousandths of an inch of weathering going in, and the inside looks like just beautiful cherry. And this came from a sawmill that use small cherry logs to make pallets. So you wouldn't think about using this outdoors, but if you read deeply into forest specifications that the US Forest Products Lab spec, it says it's rot resistant. So anyway, uh, thank you, appreciate. I was hoping I'm done. <coughs> Sorry, where's the play? Full screen. <coughs> Hi everyone, um, it's really great to be here and I'm enjoying everything that's being said so much and really excited for the rest of the day. Um, so I'm here to present a, a book project that's, that's really recently existent. Um, it's just barely been printed and it's a project of many people. Um, it's co-edited by Daniel Ibanez, who's a doctoral student at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and Kiel Mo, who's recently at McGill University and myself. Um, and the contributors include a broad range of people, um, including architects, foresters, uh, photographers, and design students. And the project was, um, we received sponsorship from the Stockwood Lumber Council and the David Rockefeller Center at Harvard University. Um, in many ways, the, the book, the idea behind this book really has a lot of affinity with the, with the day, this day today and this, this conference. Um, it looks at this like seemingly straightforward topic of wood and um, tries to think about it in multiple ways at multiple scales. Kiel, Danny, and I are all interested in wood for different reasons. Kiel works with mass timber, con timber construction and studies thermal capacities. Uh, Danny's looking at urban metabolism and material processing, and I've been researching construction material flows and relationship to like social and political 
agendas um, related to land. And together, we're really interested in you know, the fact that for all of the reasons that are going to be brought up today, um, Wood's legible and renewable cycle, its remarkable physical properties and cultural significance, and the fact that its use is entwined with the world's greatest socio-ecological issues. Um, and so we're, while we're really excited about the resurgence that Wood has in the design disciplines and the interests that, that exist, we also feel that it's important to kind of get to know it better um, and as the last speaker spoke so eloquently about, to really think about it not as a, not as a single thing, but to think about its, its many, um, many lives, many species, many properties um, and implications. And so today I'm just going to introduce the book and, and some of the questions that, we, that drove us to, to gather this, this work. Um, so this book was developed from a symposium that we, hel that we held under the same name at the GSD at the Graduate School of Design, a collaboration with the Timber Innovation Center at the Catholic University in Santiago. And really the symposium and the book stemmed from the discussions of this day. So how is designing with wood more than simply this, the substitution for timber, steel, concrete, and masonry construction? How can wood design engage complex relationships of material production, thermodynamics, carbon cycles, deforestation, land rights, and biodiversity? And how could, how could the, the the very principles and properties um, of wood, its biophysical habitats and social and political histories actually be generative of the way that we work with it. So what's the relationship between what we're making, the forms that it takes, the way that we design, and these things which are sometimes considered external to, to design. They seem out, outside of the, the box. Um, and so many of the people who contributed to the symposium um, and many of the students as well, the work that they're doing as graduate student research were um, kind of integrated into the book. And essentially the, the book in many ways is geared towards, towards thinking through how these questions can be raised in education and um, how students can start to make links between these different, so often disparate scales and concerns. So the structure of the book um, spans, as the, the title suggests, across scales. Um, and then in each chapter we have um, an introduction, a position from somebody who's kind of um, a theorist or a practitioner, a forester, um, a, a international case study, a, a built project, a more speculative design project, um, which is often student research, ongoing student research, and then a visual essay which composed of, um, of, kind of artist projects which, which relate to the topics. So the first, uh, the first chapter was a starting point for us, which was to suspend the discussion of wood as if it were a single thing. Um, and this, the chapter unpacks our understanding of wood as a generic commodity, looking at the ways that specific wood species and their unique properties relate to the very particular landscapes from which they come. Um, the chapter includes an interview with forester Sean Mahoney, who might be showing up today, um, and about the way that foresters design the quality and conditions that trees grow in, examinations of large-scale afforestation projects and former Wood at Work contributor and U of T graduate Julia Smachelow looking at incentivized con conservation through small private land management in southern Ontario. Um, the next chapter, Carbon, looks at the way in which carbon enters discussions of wood construction today from greenwashing to new conceptualizations of carbon cycling, starting with Charles Lindsay's otherworldly beautiful images um, looking at carbon emulsion and light and looking at the way that carbon relations in different forms of wood construction systems um, uh, kind of play out. And here, Alan Organchi's visualizing the ebb and flow of carbon in the production of a new school. Uh, the third chapter, Thermal, focuses on the latent thermal potential of mass timber buildings. Uh, this project looks at how the density of different species of wood um, and the type of construction and the source of wood impact thermal performance, so trying to link across these different, um, different scales. And then here are Salman Craig and Jonathan Grinham considering walls as exchangers rather than insulators at the molecular level. Um, in ecology, uh, this chapter examines wood production landscapes from plantations to forests as sites of social and biophysical complexity where conflicting priorities for exploitation, use, and preservation play out. Um, these are uh, Toronto-based photographer Rita Leisner's photographs of tree planters in northern Ontario, which is a rite of passage for many Canadian youth, and these, these photographs really show the, the sublime landscape and the labor involved in, in the planting of, of trees, um, and she uses, she uses techniques gained from, 
her experience as a war photographer for, for taking these photographs. Um, the chapter looks at architecture linked to wood cooperatives and the role of forests um, for indigenous non non wood based. So when when forests are also not just for ex, uh, you know extraction and use of consideration of trees. So other ways in which forests are are the the kind of res occupied by by people as explored in this um, this piece by Aram and Danka about central India, people living in the forest in central India. Um, Urbanism looks at the role of wood building and trees growing at the urban scale. And here Albert Pope and Jesus Vasayo's proposal for the rehabilitation of Corktown in Detroit with tree plantations and new wood constructions at um, public housing in Norway. And here the Catholic University Timber Innovation Center's projects to consider multi-unit wood developments and their typological variation, which runs along Chile's um, uh, but kind of biophysical transect. And then finally, uh, metabolism considers larger scale processes of material flows across scales, engaging Alex McLean's photographic work on wood production and construction, Stefano Boeri's uh, vision for a regional network of wood production for Milan, and a student-led project Horizon House constructed in Hokkaido, Japan, built from locally sourced and salvaged materials. So really, uh, the aim of the book is to prompt some questions about what a transscalar agenda for wood might look like and how um, <clears throat> increasingly these, like thinking through these different uh, scales and, and working with, with different, um, different levels, different types of expertise is, is critical to, to designing anything with wood. Um, so Kiel is gonna be, is on the train from Montreal and will be here this afternoon. So is also happy to talk with anyone about the, the content. So thank you very much. Oh, okay. So the book is out. We actually have a few copies for anyone who would like to peruse it. It's you can you can pre-order it. We are not able. We don't, we can't actually sell it. Um, but th we'll have some copies out during the breaks. Um, we're going to try to make up a little bit of time, so I think we'll cut into our coffee break by a few minutes and we'll keep the discussion a little shorter. So I think we've got about 15 minutes and try to save maybe time for one, maybe one or two questions from the floor too. So take it away. Sounds right. good. Uh, and I'm going to stand here because of the mic. Um, no, no, it's fine. I just, there is no uh, headset. So I'll, I'll just uh, stand here if you don't mind. Uh, thank you for your uh, incredible uh, presentations um, and a real uh, broad range of, of uh, perspectives and issues. I wanted to start with um, one question that has to do with some of those, uh, some of you who are working more on uh, municipal and regional uh, forest management. And um, you had uh, mentioned the kind of multifaceted uh, benefits and objectives that are driving uh, urban forests. Um, I wonder if in, in, in a couple of minutes you can describe again the kind of um, motivations or the drivers that are behind uh, urban forests. And, and if you could talk to what in your mind, in your experience has been the sort of the top driver for getting uh, municipal or government or political buy-in into some of the efforts that you're uh, that you've mentioned, whether they're operational, financial, uh, inter-governing um, structures, or, or interdivisional, the kind of the major breaks that you have to do, the, these kind of major changes that you've had to do if you can identify these kind of top driver or drop drivers in your mind that have really uh, kind of changed or, or made these paradigm shifts possible. Brand, perhaps you'd like to start? Uh, sure, can people hear me? This thing working? Yeah, I'm ready to turn it on. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, thank you. That worked, even I can hear myself now. Uh, so uh, I will try to answer efficiently. It's a big question. 
Uh, I should say, you know, I'm trained as an, an ecologist as well as a forester, and I'm interested, and I was interested in biodiversity, but that is not the primary driver for these forests and the city's investment and for local stewardship, although that's more complicated. Uh, the, I want to sort of quickly tell the story of Mayor Bloomberg and Plan YC that led to the Million Trees Initiative to sort of encapsulate these drivers that you're asking about. So um, before Mayor Bloomberg um, was in office, a very small city agency um, uh, which is focused on population dynamics. I forgot its formal name, but I think there's like 10 people in the agency. But what they do is study population dynamics in the city. They came out with a study just before Mayor Bloomberg was in office that said New York City is going to grow by more than 100, by a million people uh, over the next decade. And so Mayor Bloomberg, when he was in office, he went to each city agency. There's a lot of city agencies but obviously the Parks Department being one of them, and said, okay, what's your plan for a growing city and to make it sustainable? It happened to be that at that time, the Forest Service had just come out with their eye tree studies, and that's going to be familiar to some people. Uh, so it gave us a distinct economic value, in this case for an individual tree, not for a forest. And so we went to him and said, look, trees increase quality of life. They come with these, quali uh, with these environmental benefits. Um, they're necessary open space. And quite frankly, about five months later, we had $400 million for the Million Trees campaign. So what is driving it, what was driving it then and what's driving it today is first and foremost population density, which is directly equated to quality of life. And that is linked to equity um, because um, mo many, many people throughout the city do not have access to nature in the way that a few select people do. And yet we're going to have more people. And as you saw the statistic before, based upon our survey, about 50%, if not more, do not leave the city for their connection to nature. So it is quality of life and density of city, and then the second driver is climate change. And I don't think I need to get into that as much because I think everyone's familiar with that, but how do we face as an East Coast city? Um, and I should just say, it's not the storms that we're thinking about as much, it's the heat. Heat is the, it's been referred, it's not my uh, uh, term, the silent killer. It is by far the more, most dangerous of all the climate change phenomena. And so this is one of the ways that the city is dealing with heat. Thank you. Uh, Ray or Amory? Sure, oh, okay, I'll go. Um, so, I think from the City of Toronto point of view, and, and I agree with Bram, um, probably the biggest driver for us was um, population and the demand on um, the, the forest resource in the city. Um, in our case, the natural area management, uh, the management of the forest is, is a relatively new program. Um, you know, we've been doing tree planting for a number of years, but actually looking after uh, managing the natural areas is, is relatively new. And, and it came about because of the demand on the, not only the park system, but all, especially the natural areas. Um, and as the population in the city has grown and there's been more and more development, land is being taken away for, you know, condos and, and apartments and, and housing. Um, you know, there's more and more people coming into the city and they're, they're looking for places to, to get outside and enjoy nature. And so there's an increased pressure on the natural areas in the city. So that has been a huge driving force for us. Um, you know, we, we're working with a lot of other divisions in the city um, to manage the natural areas because a lot of other divisions have infrastructure, like Toronto Water will have infrastructure. We're working with the transportation the services division in the city to increase the trail system, make it more, make the ravine system more accessible to people. Um, 
Yeah, I'll, I don't know if you want to. Sure. Add yeah, anything. I think it's also, you know, and to kind of build on those points, one of the the, the big catalysts that really drove home the importance of, of 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 the need for these spaces, I think, um, invasive species, especially here in Toronto, Asian, you know, the possible outbreak of Asian longhorn beetle, emerald ash borer, actually brought a brought about a huge, a tremendous investment um, that really, really grew urban forestry at the city of Toronto, in part because of how vulnerable our forests were to some of these invasive species, like uh, emerald ash borer, which is making its way to New York, but had a tremendous impact on Toronto. And I think the invasive species like that um, really drives home a lot of those challenges, and often is you know, the lightning rod that gets a lot of public policy decision makers um, thinking about that stuff, so, yeah. I should just add, Emerald Ash Borer is in New York City. Uh -huh. It's already made its way. <laughs> so, so, actually, thank you for that. The, uh, this brings up another um, uh, thought that, that uh, was part of the discussion and um, debate uh, the other night on the biodiversity panel, uh, which has to do with what you just touched upon, the invasives. Uh, and this um, question around uh, the prioritization of native versus non-native plants, uh, the connection and sometimes um, disconnection between non-natives and invasives, uh, and that's sometimes a misconception, um, and how do we go about making these prioritizations, these, these decisions, <coughs> when we have um, uh, degraded urban conditions or environmental conditions for, for, uh, for tree growth, um, the advancing uh, impacts of climate change, um, and, um, and, and these questions around uh, adaptability or adaptable uh, management strategies. So what, what in your mind, and, and others can jump in as well, what in your mind, uh, how, how do you go about in your, in your respective fields um, tackling these, these tough issues around native, non-native invasiveness and these decisions in urban environments? Well, with that, I think the, the discussion of native, non-natives, non-invasive, invasives is, is one that I'm tackling with, with the tree planting strategy. I think the level of education in terms of educating public and consumers in general about the importance of native versus non-native species has definitely come a long, long way, let's say, from 20 years ago. Uh, Toronto is a very, has a living legacy of that, I think, with a lot of Norway maples. We sort of see where people's mindset were. But I think one of the challenges today um, you know, I think biodiversity is absolutely important, it's absolutely crucial, but I think getting people to move between those scales, whether we're looking at an individual street tree in a concrete pit, or looking at trees in a ravine or natural area, I think there is that bit of nuance that we have to find, that fine tune that, you know, and there are certain hardscape areas, and I worked extensively in New York in hardscapes, where there's nothing native about those conditions, and while we certainly won't plant an invasive tree, per se, but if we're stuck in that situation where it's between tree or no tree, we don't have much of a choice there. And, and, and that's not something I don't think any forester should take lightly. But at the same time, I think we're looking at these big natural areas where there's tremendous potential for restoring and protecting biodiversity. And so I think from that standpoint, part of my task in writing this strategy is bringing that education piece to try to bring a bit more nuance to this native versus non-native discussion, which is fantastic that people have caught on, but also letting people know that there are certain circumstances where, where the planting of non-native but non-invasive trees may be necessary. And I think, I think that, that, that language is important, necessity, where you do have things like urban heat island effect and other detrimental effects on the community, where the benefit of planting it, a non-native species where no other tree can survive outweighs um, the cost. And just, sorry, I just want to just quickly make the distinction in New York City. So our street tree planting palette is not a exclusively native palette. Obviously, we're not planting invasive species, um, but we're planting the right tree for the right location. Our palette for our forest restoration is exclusively native, 
and, and all of it come. We have a native plant center in Staten Island where we collect seed within 150 miles of the city. And so all the plants put into those forests come from that seed collection. I do want to add, we're not going to answer this on the stage or now, but there is a pretty robust discussion in New York City now, and I'm imagining everywhere, about novel ecosystem. No city, uh, it, no matter how prosperous it is, and New York City is very prosperous, is going to commit the amount of money that you need to restore its 10,300 acres of forests to be exclusively native. We're going to make choices where we spend that money, and other areas are going to become novel ecosystems. So what do you do with them? How do you value them? How does the neighborhood value them? They are questions that we are trying to answer now. I'm just going to try to manage your time here. I'm so sorry to cut things short. But I think if there's one or two burning questions from the floor, I'd love to just give that opportunity to everyone. And then we're, we're sort of cutting into our coffee break. And we are going to have to start our, our next panel um, at, the, at quarter two. Um, so if, um, if there's a few questions, I'm going to pass the mic out. Is that OK, everyone? Sure. Hi, I'm Jenny, a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Forestry. Um, this is probably a question for Amory, Ray, or Bram, who deal with city problems. And um, just want to ask you, can you speak to some of the challenges or solutions of trying to increase canopy cover on private lands, mainly like residential areas? I do realize that Ray did talk a bit about that by forming partnerships, but what are some of the other challenges and solutions for that? Well, I, I think the, the big piece for us that we're examining is this whole idea of public-private partnerships. And so there are limitations to any municipality's ability, and I think Bram touched on that as well. And that's something that we're currently looking at here at the city. And it may not necessarily be one public-private partnerships, but it may be multiple public-private partnerships that allows us to expand our capacity across traditional divides where municipalities end at the right-of-way. Um, and so, you know, we're looking at examples just like with Bram's Natural Areas Conservancy and to see how we partner and how we leverage resources. And New York City does not have a very good plan, if at all, in how to manage private forest. We were supposed to plant, as part of the Million Trees Initiative, about a third or a quarter of the trees on private land through our private partners and it did not go well. And I, there's a lot of reasons, and we don't have the time to go through it, in part because we don't even have a tree protection law for private land in New York City, which those of us who have been foresters for a while have been pushing. So there's a real distinct gap in the city's willingness and investment in public forest, but its lack as it relates to private forest, and that's a big deal. Um. Is there anyone that has a, just going to try to, again, manage the time, a question for, um, for Paul or Jane on the, the, the question of the wood and integrating that um, thinking into urban um, landscape and other dimensions of that? Any urban wood people here, um, landscape architects? And if not, we can keep going with whatever questions you do have, but I'm just curious as to how that um, rings, rings true here. Yes? I'll, I'll take I'll take that chance. So um, <laughs> shameless plug for my, my own cause, but uh, I was just uh, uh, curious if um, kind of interplay. Uh, so I'm from Portland, Oregon. I mill urban trees into lumber. Um, it's been kind of an interesting dynamic with I think just seeing how cities and municipalities deal with that whole issue of like what do you do with trees when they die and where does that go? And uh, I'm curious to hear uh, any case studies in Toronto or in uh, um, New York City. Um, and just find out uh, what happens to the trees. And then also, you know, obviously, uh, Paul made an interesting case about just what kind of woods you can use outside, which I think definitely important, pretty, seem to be pretty limited to cedar. Plus, red cedar is kind of the main choice. But there's obviously a lot of different options. Yeah, so what happens to the trees in the city after they're cut down? So I, I'll speak for Toronto. Um, 
So when, when our operations department does remove trees, um, they're taken to central yards. We do have contracts with um, wood composting companies. So up here it's um, Grow Bark and there's another company called Earthco. Um, they, we have contracts with them and they haul the wood off site and, or they'll tub grind it on site and then haul the woods to their own yards and use it in composting processes. Some of the wood we do keep in the city um, and we use it internally, um, again, as compost or mulch for, for planting beds in the parks department. Um, when we were harvesting a lot of ash trees, we did have, for a very short time, a small contract with a local sawmill company. Um, and they came in and stationed at one of the yards and uh, salvaged a lot of uh, the ash trees and, and turned it into, you know, flooring or, or cabin, tr cabin wood. Um, whatever um, and then occasionally we will use trees for you know art projects or like benches down at the waterfront we've done that as well and then oh sorry oh, you go. Just, you go. this uh, this question made me think about the the question about invasives and or trees that were being removed and I actually had a question for Paul which was what is the in your work what is the potential for thinking about the things that are actually being removed systematically the, the trees as, you know, wood to be specified. Are you referring to a, a program in the city where there's going to ever remove trees? Yeah. So like for... I don't have a right. mic yet. I need... Mm -hmm. So, um, well, first of all... Uh, it's, on. It's, on. it's on. It's on. It's on. First, first of all, you, you, you need to think of it be other than a tree. Mm -hmm. You need to have a kind of matrix of, well, what kind of tree it is, what are the uses that that species of tree, and does it meet uh, you know, certain uh, grade or diameter, or whatever parameters. And then you, you catalog a potential use for all the trees that you're cutting down. And some of them won't make the cut. Some of them should be chipped up. Some of them actually rot very quickly and so on. But some of them are really suitable for uh, outdoor fixtures, you know, surrounds around garbage bins. I mean, simple stuff or little railings that guide uh, wheelchairs along paths and so on. There's no reason to reach out to to South America or you know to, to Oklahoma or whatever to get this. But the key is that you recognize which the species of the tree and and what characteristics that wood has that appropriate for uses that you have for wood. There should be a direct connection instead of going to the lumber yard and buying pressure treated lumber so you can make a railing for wheelchairs along a, a, a walkway, you should recognize that there are several species uh, uh, that you are likely to cut down that would be perfect for that. Mm -hmm. So it's just knowledge of what you're cutting down and knowledge of what it could be used for. Um, this is what coffee breaks are for to keep the conversation going. So um, just to protect our schedule and timing, let's uh, thank this panel. This is a great start to the day. And I just encourage you to, uh, to find these guys and, and, and ask them questions and enjoy some coffee. We're going to start in, in 15 minutes from now for our second panel of the day. If we can get the uh, folks that are giving the lightning talks to come forward, that's Dorian, Eric, Joe, Sheila. Um, we're going to have you come right up to the front and grab a seat. Up on the stage. I'm going to have the next group come right up onto the stage. I'm very happily starting to get covered in sawdust, which is a really good sign at a conference that that's possible. And behind me is a, a slab of black cherry that was just cut by Dorian Lavallee on the Woodmiser sawmill. Come on, come on up. Um, Wood at Work is, is structured in, as you're discovering, somewhat of an informal way. We're really trying to get people um, just get people out to meet each other and talk. So one of the ways to do that are these lightning talks, which are very short. They're five minutes each. 
Um, so we have, we have four folks in this, in this group, and we may have time for a few questions after, but they're going to give a really brief uh, picture of their work um, and what they're doing. So just very briefly, I'm not going to give long introductions. Um, Eric Davies, Joe Vaccaro, Sheila Dendron, and Dorian Lavallee. Um, just representing different, very cool work. I, I, I encountered Eric's work, I'll just say this, in an article in the Toronto Star that came out maybe two, three weeks ago uh, that was really mind-blowing about very old trees in the city. Um, so I'm just going to use that as an intro to you, and then we're just, gonna, we're just going to take it away. So it'll be um, Eric, and then Dorian, and then Sheila, and then Joe. And I'll let you guys just give a quick intro of your work as you get up there. Uh, this one here? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, it works. Uh, well, I'd just like to say thank you very much for the, the introduction to this conference. This is really one of the most exciting types of conferences I've seen. It's so, so broad and varied. I was, uh, the, digger, the deeper I dug into the talks, the more I, I, I realized how interested I was in it. So um, I'm going to quickly go through uh, this idea of rewilding Toronto. Let me just see if, uh, there we go. Um, that's the Toronto Ravines, it's just an overlay showing roughly the area, which is about uh, 27,000 acres, it's just about 17% of this uh, of, of Toronto. Um, and uh, I work with Sandy Smith, who's at the back here doing a little bit of urban forestry work. We had found this old historical study that was from 1977, and we resurveyed it, and uh, I'm not going to get too deep into the details, but we looked at the wildflowers, and as you'd expect, uh, native species are declining, lots of non-native species, about 93% of the plots had invasives. The insects, um, just kind of starting to build a baseline on those, the historical data uh, wasn't really comprehensive. Uh, did some bird work with some novel sound recorders, again, found that the birds were declining. Uh, we did some small mammal trapping, we have a mammologist at UAT Forestry. And uh, again, uh, mammals such as the flying squirrel, no longer really in Toronto. Um, and then the trees, which uh, again, found a decline in the, uh, uh, the incidence and abundance of native species and a real issue with Norway maple. Um, this is just one slide of uh, an area we surveyed uh, in Rosedale Ravine. And you can imagine historically it was 100% native. In 1977, there was 10% Nora maple, and then when we resurveyed it in 2015, it was about 40%, and projecting that forward just with conservative estimates shows where uh, this area is going. Now, um, there might have been a little bit more Norway maple here than other parts. There's some other parts of the ravines that are quite healthy, but uh, uh, species, like the invasive species we heard, they can, if they get out of check, they can really expand. Um, just putting up this, quick uh, figure here at the Wood at Work conference in terms of wood. This is just uh, in forestry, silviculture, a reverse J-curve. No need to really look at it besides the top of the bar is what, where you'd want to be for each age class. And that little sliver is really what we found, which is about under 5% of the stocking factor. So you need to bring that stuff back. Maybe for some of you folks in here, you, that red line at the bottom is interesting. That's Norway maple. And it's really uh, starting to come up um, the, it, per acre, there's about 16,000 board feet of Nora maple from the polewood class up. So it might be a neat thing to think about how could this wood, if it was to be removed, uh, to be used, and again, with the salvaged wood. Um, when we were finishing this report, we, uh, we came across the work of the Natural Areas Conservancy, and it just completely changed our perspective. It, it, it really kind of... Uh, showed us what could be done, and so we changed the recommendations of the report to basically just say, look at the Natural Areas Conservancy, and it's just so easy to get excited. Uh, and with the two minutes left, uh, so I think that if you want to check out that report, there's the website there, but uh, really what you want to look at is a Natural Areas Conservancy. Um, just kind of buzz through this idea of rewilding, which is what uh, uh, Scott had mentioned. We hear about rewilding animals, but Rewilding plants is a really important thing. All the Leopold 1918 again, 
emphasizes we need the full diversity of our native species. And so one of the pilot projects we had was mapping these old growth trees in the Toronto ravines. We've got about a thousand mapped. And uh, this is the article that Paul said. Um, the point I kind of wanted to make just buzzing through this is that, so this was a big year for white oak. And uh, this only happens 10 to 20 times a century. So growing these seeds um, was something we thought we'd start engaging and we started engaging with the city. Here's a tree in the ravines. Um, this is the tree outside the Royal Ontario Museum. There's the guy who's had his ice cream truck there for 50 years. And uh, here's a guy, uh, it turns out he's from a local homeless shelter, but um, I'll just leave you with this quote that uh, Aldo Leopold said, our ability to perceive quality in nature begins as an art with the pretty. It expands through successive stages of the beautiful to values as yet uncaptured by language. And the big tree, uh, not only is it valuable from its genetic perspective in terms of local adaptation and biodiversity, but starting with these positive stories that uh, um, we can engage with them seems like a, um, it's not as technical as the, you know, what we really, really need to be doing with uh, the organization, but this might be a nice, uh, nice way to, to uh, get some good work done. So I just stop there and thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. As always, uh, my name is Dorian Lavallee. I'm from Woodmiser Canada. I'm the national sales manager. Um, we represent the Woodmiser company, and we sell portable sawmills. And I'd like to thank Scott, as always, for getting me into an interesting place with a 26-foot sawmill in the back of my truck, easier than Montreal. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're, I, I always like to come down because it's always fun to see the academics get so excited about what's happening out with that tree. Um, we brought an old cherry tree down to repurpose into tabletops, bar tops, coffee tables, you name it. So, and, and a big push at Woodmiser in the last two or three years has been urban renewal um, and then urban repurposing of wood. Uh, we have brought out a lot of our publications now are aimed towards that. What can you do with a city tree? What can you do with a tree on a property, whether it's city or not? Uh, there's so many things that you can do with wood and I don't know that people always understand that. There seems to be a big a big genesis, I guess, or a renaissance of somebody always wants now a piece of wood in their home, condo, whatever. So we're, we're seeing a lot more people buying wood misers, more sawmills in general, to start to repurpose wood. And you don't see as many, we hardly see anybody anymore cutting a two by six. Everyone's doing this sort of thing or a dimensional of this to make it look nice or pretty to serve something on. And for wood miser, our push is becoming more and more global as well. So it's not only repurposing wood, but now as we move out into South America, Africa, that sort of thing, we're also finding purpose for villages with a sawmill. Uh, what can you do? What can be brought? Um, you know, you can build desks and chairs. One of the missions that we supported, uh, and Woodmiser does do a lot of their work through missions in Africa, is this gentleman started making uh, beehives. So all the wood that was generally going to be put into charcoal which they didn't want to do, you couldn't make any money from it. He now cuts them into, I think it's a one by six, about two and a half feet long, and they make a beehive. And every family that gets one of these beehives can now sell the honey. So they manufacture the hive, they sell the honey, they make money, they bring it into the village. A lot more of the women are involved. So as I think we see on the television and the news and the reports, when you get women involved, things become more creative, there's more money in the house. So we're really seeing a drive behind that as well. Um, and then here in, as I said, in North America, the mills are being used to repurpose a variety of wood. You'll hear more of that from Sheila, I think. Um, all of our magazines, a lot of our focus now is, as I said, urban renewal, urban reuse. Um, on my not that much followed Instagram page, I try and do a lot of that. So it's what's interesting. Uh, a lot of the people that are now, I, that I follow and that are following me are all doing the same thing. There's very little dimensional lumber going into a kiln. It's all this to make bar tops, table tops, whatever, and repurpose one tree at a time, as opposed to sending it to the landfill, chipping it, um, you know, and that sort of thing. So we're really trying to encourage, um, not me personally, but through government and that sort of thing. No, that's me. Oops. Um, less trees into the landfill. A lot of the arborists are starting to, oh, it's like when I was in public speaking. In grade school. <laughs> um, a lot of the arborists will no longer take a high-value tree to be chipped at the landfill. 
they'll repurpose it to make more money, more money out of it. Um, I was joking outside, but I could probably sell that to somebody in here for $100. And the piece of wood that it came out of would have cost me about 20 bucks. So there's you know, obviously money to be made for the smart people in the world as well. Um, having said that, as I said, Wood Miser is a big push to do what we're doing here today, to show people what you can do with a sawmill. Is this more than make a two by six to build a house? Uh, there's so many other things that you can do as well with them to repurpose, to reuse, to recycle, and to make sure that trees become, you know, are, their life continues to grow as a whatever, a keepsake, something nice to look at in your home. So, thank you. Glasses on. What's the name? Samuel said. Oh, that's the flash talk, right? Mm -hmm. So that's here. Here we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Sheila from Samuel Sid. Um, I am co-owner and uh, we are urban wood specialists. So urban wood waste, every year one to 200,000 trees come down in the GTA due to storms. Uh, old growth trees also are fallen as they die and become unsafe. And as we've seen with the emerald ash borer, uh, we have a lot of trees coming down from disease. Uh, this number is going to rise significantly with climate change as storms and disease will endanger the urban wood canopy. Where does all this wood go when it comes down? Uh, when it's fallen, the wood is transported to several of the GTA's municipal wood diversion lots. So basically football, football field size lots full of wood. The wood is kept there for several months and once there's enough of it, uh, it gets wood chipped. Once it's wood chipped, it's then tub ground and made into like a fine material. Um, this then goes to landfill, which eventually breaks down and turns into carbon dioxide. A small portion of the wood chips are used for municipal projects such as tree planting, playgrounds and that kind of thing. But there is a solution to wood waste. If we recover the wood from the sites, we can repurpose the wood uh, by using portable sawmills and making it into valuable wood products. And I'm sorry, I don't have the wood miser up there. I do have it on another clip though. <laughs> um, the, uh, it does create local jobs and contributes to a local green economy. So. Unlike traditional sawmills, portable mills um, are really great for urban wood because typically, um, or oftentimes, it will have nails or hardwood in it. And because of where it's growing, sometimes they can be really stressed and hard to cut. Um, so the portable sawmills um, are really great for cutting urban wood. So once it's repurposed, um, our wonderful woodworkers make things like kitchen tables, dining room tables. Um, there's a picture of a, a live edge countertop in a bathroom up there. So, uh, so some typical things and then some neat things that can be made. Also, we can make it into lumber. Um, we also can make it into live edge products, which you can see, and material for artists and filmmakers. So where do we make this happen? So at the Tree and Wood Recovery Centre in Mississauga, in 2016, the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority really liked the idea of repurposing wood and opened the first tree and wood recovery centre in Canada. Uh, this centre is currently run by us, Samil Sid, and wood, wood waste is now being diverted uh, from the municipal wood lots and then is sent to the, the Tree and Wood Recovery Centre to be repurposed. So why is this important? So trees spend their whole life um, sucking in CO2. When it's tub ground and sent to landfill, all the CO2 is, re CO2 is released back into the atmosphere. So wood products capture the CO2, so actually one cubic meter of wood made into a product equals one ton of carbon capture, so pretty significant. So basically, wood products help fight climate change. And good things happen here at the Tree and Wood Recovery Centre. 
we had a youth forestry day and I think what I'll do is I'll touch on, we just actually did a youth forestry week with Forest Ontario, uh, Fleming College, um, still a few other people, Western Forest Products. Um, and so it was in an effort to um, educate the kids on all the different uh, jobs in forestry. So really, really fun day, fun week actually. Um, we're also portable. So uh, we did a project for a company called Treevest, which is a real estate company. Um, they had two or 300 ash trees come down uh, because of the emerald ash borer. Um, they were devastated. Uh, it left an awful kind of mark in their small forest that they had. Um, so we had a day, two days actually, where we went and brought the mill there and repurposed uh, wood and captured 5.5 tons of CO2, I believe. Um, some of the staff bought wood. That uh, wood that was sold went to the World Wildlife Foundation. Uh, the balance of the wood that wasn't sold was donated to Habitat. So very good things happened out of that wood. We also do donations ourselves. Um, we've donated to every high school in Simcoe County, which made buddy benches for the kids. Um, there's Sasha on the Wood Miser, uh, doing the Girls Can Two project for the TRCA, Bolton Camp. We've also won several awards um, along our journey here. Sawmill SIDS impact. So, uh, sorry, this, is a, this presentation's a little old. We captured 6,800 tons of CO2 in 2016 by making wood products, which also diverted 6,800 tons of wood waste from landfills. We've completed pilot projects. We've educated youth. Um, provided tours to other municipalities in the effort that they may duplicate what we're doing, um, engaged communities by donating more wood. I think that's it. And if you're looking for wood promotion, uh, go to at Cutting Edge Sasha. Um, and thank you. These are, oops, a thank you to our partners. Thank you. All right, well, uh, hello everyone. Joe Vaccaro with the Ontario Home Builders Association. Uh, we are an advocacy association for our membership of uh, 4,000 plus member companies, 29 local associations, and uh, I think uh, our, uh, our number one priority is uh, increasing housing supply and choice across Ontario. So what does this mean for the home builders and why, why is wood so important to what we do? Beyond the traditional, of course, uh, single family, uh, part three sort of home building structure, um, there was an opportunity to bring six-story wood to Ontario, something that BC had brought in and that uh, we got involved in in terms of bringing that opportunity here to Ontario. And so from our perspective, the opportunity to bring six-story wood to Ontario represented an opportunity for builders to have another option, consumers to have another choice in terms of their housing option, but it also uh, facilitated for us an opportunity to talk about all the other commercial opportunities that wood provides. And so along with a lot of the discussion I've heard this morning about urban forestry and canopy, the reality is that from a commercial standpoint, there is an opportunity to reconnect people to wood products in the homes they live in. So in a place like Toronto or in, in dense areas, it's a wall of concrete, right? It's building after building of concrete and glass. This provides an opportunity to reconnect people to wood from a housing standpoint, six story. And so as we move forward and as the slide sort of jokes a little bit about, we got wood in 2010, 2011, 2012 with six-story wood, and now we're moving towards we want bigger wood. We want taller buildings. We want mass timber buildings. So being at a center like this kind of reinforces our perspective as home builders. These are options that we should be able to explore and bring to the marketplace. These are options that will reconnect people to the wood products and more, more importantly, to the sort of wood forestry perspective that a lot of people are bringing here today, right? Because when you live in a facility like this, which is really glorifying and really showcasing what wood could be in our city building exercises. It will help reconnect people to the other perspectives around the table. I would also say that what we've seen in terms of success is that we've seen 60 plus projects in the planning, development, or occupancy stage in the last three, four years. And we're gonna see more of these things because what we've learned from the experience is that bringing this kind of a building option to Ontario provides an opportunity to develop sites that we're not going to be 
uh, financially viable with concrete, or we're going to be difficult to deal with in a community where traffic, noise, construction issues always come up. So this new option provides an opportunity now for builders to bring these options to the table. It also provides an opportunity to bring density to community in a way which is much more neighborhood friendly at times, gives a lot more of an architectural opportunity for people to be much more creative, and really showcases, I think, some unbelievable wood innovation. And so I know yesterday part of your tour was visiting Liberty Village and some of the work being done there. That's a great member who jumped on to this idea as soon as possible, saw an opportunity to bring a different architectural look to that community, and saw an opportunity to really showcase what Timberwood can be. Um, let me leave you with uh, some closing remarks here. Um, the future for wood in the home building industry is growing. The opportunities are there. Members are interested in it. We are seeing a new class of architects, designers, engineers looking at wood products in a totally different way. We're also seeing uh, the exploration of this kind of technology that we already see in Europe finding its way here in different ways. And so that provides great opportunities across the board, not just from a home building and commercial perspective, but also in a broader discussion around what wood can do and advancing wood products can do in the Ontario marketplace. And we have a great opportunity here through the excellence that we can develop here to commercialize, commercialize it and bring it across the country and bring it across North America. So my perspective, obviously, from a home building perspective is the business side of this equation, what it means in our marketplace. But again, I go back to the ability to reconnect living in a showcase with wood housing community, what it means to that bigger conversation. I think a lot of you are having here today about biodiversity, what are we doing with our urban forestry? What are the opportunities? How do we reconnect everyone? Not just to a world of concrete, but to a world of wood. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, all four of you. That was amazing. So as the next panel is coming up, we're going to just take a few questions uh, for the four lightning talk round uh, members here. So um, Sarah's going to start organizing. If you're on panel number two, Global Forest Partnerships, please come up to the to the front and get yourself ready. So just a couple minutes of questions. Um, anything from the floor? I could bring the mic out to you. Where you are. Yes. Oh, it's just a, a brief question for Joe. I, I, uh, you didn't tell us what that building was, the one that you were standing, the photo that you showed sure. us? Sorry, that was a, a six-story wood. Uh, we took a group of home builders out to BC, actually, to start looking at what they had done in British Columbia. Uh, to start generating ideas. So that's a six-story wood building being built out in British Columbia. Uh, at this point, it is completely occupied. And uh, from what I understand, that people are happy to live in that structure. So that's what we're looking at there. And so you, you six mentioned there's 60, 60 projects underway. Can you mention any of those? Or? Yeah, so there are, uh, there are a number of uh, six-story wood buildings built in the Niagara region. Oh, sorry. In the Niagara region. We have a number of six-story wood buildings being uh, built in London. And what's interesting in the London situation is a number of those buildings are related back to affordable housing uh, because the building option to build a six-story wood panelized building is much more efficient and cost-effective. So we're seeing a lot of the affordable housing um, funding that the federal and provincial government have been providing finding their way into those buildings because of how efficient they are to build, how quickly they can be turned over and provide to the marketplace. So um, it provides a great building option for a number of, of uh, building opportunities. Another question? Alex. Uh, Sheila, question for you. Uh, I just want to understand um, how, how the business that, that you started functions. Is it a nonprofit or a for profit? And, and do you have a contract with the city or do you work with individuals primarily? Um, just because it seems like a really interesting model in the urban setting, and I, I want to understand how, how it works. Yeah, so it is a for-profit model. Um, I come from a charitable background, <laughs> so I think my, my charitable background and, and the for-profit business just kind of intermixed. Um, I also seen a really wonderful way that uh, we could repurpose wood, divert it from the woodlots, uh, create a business, but also then bring the community together through the use of wood, because it is natural and kids love it. And, and I can tell you when kids come to the, the woodlot, they're grabbing a stick and they're jumping on logs and playing Star Wars. I mean, they're just, they're ju it's just a natural thing for them. Um, we do have the contracts uh, with the City of Toronto um, on some of their wood diversion lots. 
Uh, we are, we, ha we do work with other municipalities besides the GTA uh, for wood as well. Um, we also have tree fellers that are dropping off their wood. So, so from the municipal standpoint, they go to a wood diversion lot. When a tree feller fells a tree for a residential uh, home, that goes to the dump the regular dump or somewhere where they can put it, which is typically wood chip. So it's cheaper for them to drop the wood off to us than it is to take it somewhere else. So we're getting wood from, from there. We actually just had a, a, a real estate company drop off wood from a barn as well because uh, they wanted to repurpose it. So there's lots of people now bringing wood to the center. And, and you have a set of sawmills, a number of different portable sawmills that you use to, to make your own. Yeah, so we have a wood miser that we use for our portable sawmill. Um, and then we have a, a custom-made sawmill that does some really big wood, so it'll cut like just over five feet wide. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Thank you, guys. It was a great, uh, great panel, and we're going to now welcome the... <laughs> Can we have everyone from the Global Forest Partnerships panel come up and uh, take a seat? Lee, Peter, Sarah, Leslie. Leslie. Come on up. So I should just very briefly introduce Dr. Sarah Wilson, uh, co-founder of Wood at Work, and has been uh, part of this from the very beginning. This is our fourth annual conference. As I said, Sarah and I are also married, so we've been collaborating um, in many ways. And uh, <laughs> welcome to the stage, Sarah, and uh, let's get this panel started. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. And I, I said it this morning, I'm just going to say it again. It is so wonderful to have you all here. This is such an exciting day, and it's such a great group of people in the room. Um, you know, it's, it's very seldom that uh, you, you see foresters talking to architects, talking to forest ecologists, talking to conservationists, or talking to people who actually work with sawmills. So um, we're just we're just thrilled. Um, thank you all for coming. This panel is similar to the last panel in that we're going to talk a lot about local communities and engaging them in forests and nature, but we are switching um, geographies and scales slightly. So we're going to be talking about uh, global forest partnerships, and by that we mean how are we how can we connect people who supply wood uh, with people who use it. And how, what do these relationships look like in the forests? And how are they impacting people? So I'm going to briefly give an overview of sort of why we're interested in forests at, at a global scale. Um, and then the panel is going to talk a lot more about the forest people relationships and how we can engage people in helping to procure wood and, and supply wood for, um, for design and, and how that relates back to their lives and livelihoods and their relationship with nature. So the, the image that you see here, um, oops, sorry about that. This is actually a, um, a picture from my PhD work, which was in the Andes in Ecuador. And the big question that I wanted to ask is, how are people in these areas um, engaging in forest restoration? And, and what you actually see here is not people working in their fields or, or clearing grass or anything like that. Oh, sorry, they actually are clearing grass, but they're doing it to plant trees. And people here are planting trees um, largely without pay, largely on their, on their Saturdays and in their, in their spare time. Um, and they're, they're doing it with a lot of hope and enthusiasm. And I really wanted to understand what is it about these communities that has um, motivated them provided them with the tools and capacity to, to plant forests in an area where there are actually still very high deforestation rates. And um, the answer that I found was that uh, the, the people who are engaging with local communities here to help them reforest actually talked to the local communities about what they needed and what they wanted and how forests relate to that vision. And in these communities, in this case, it was that people were replanting trees for water, so that's a little bit different than wood. But the same idea applies understanding why would people want to engage with forests, how do they engage with forests, and how can we link that to our, our wood supply and our wood purchasing. And just to show you, this is the type of forest in that area that they were trying so hard to, to bring back and restore. This is Ecuadorian cloud forest. So I'm going to take a step back and just talk very briefly about, you know, why, why are we talking about forests 
Um, why are they so important now? I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir for a lot of this, but I just want to give sort of a brief overview of, of some of the dialogue around forests globally and how that links to wood. So one of the reasons we're talking about forests is that they are an incredibly important uh, tr uh, biome in the world. They're bigger than a biome, but they, they used to cover over 50% of the global land area on the planet. Today, they cover um, about just under 30%, so we've lost nearly 50% uh, of the world's original forest cover. And you can see from this slide that a lot of that deforestation historically has happened in Europe, a lot of it in Asia, some in the Americas, um, and also some in Africa. The next frontier for forest clearing is really occurring now in the tropics. There is some deforestation in, in the temperate and boreal biomes, but by and large we're seeing most of the deforestation happening in tropical regions. And despite a lot of talk recently, which is, which is very positive about um, you know, decreasing deforestation rates in, in places like the Amazon, we are still seeing a lot of clearing. And in 2016, 2017 were two of the worst years on record for tropical uh, tree cover loss. This is just a graph from, you can see that tree, tree, um, tree cover loss per year for different years over time. And that's been increasing. Um, the majority of that tropical deforestation is coming from Brazil, and that's largely the Amazon rainforest. This is a picture of deforestation and the typical clearing pattern in the Amazon. Uh, the second, and, and so this graph over here is showing you the amount of forest lost in um, 2017, so Brazil is what, way up there at the top. Uh, the next greatest area was in the, the Congo Basin, and the third is in uh, Indonesia. So this is where we're really losing our forests, and a lot of the forests in these places are incredibly biodiverse. So one of the reasons that we are so concerned about this is that, you know, uh, tropical forests house between 50 and 80 percent of the world's terrestrial biodiversity, depending on how you measure that. And they're also extremely important for mitigating climate change. So these are, I'm not going to get into this too much. This is a really interesting um, figure from Frances Seymour's book, Why Forest, Why Now? And she's been um, at the last two Wood at Work um, conferences. She couldn't make it this year, but she's a really, really amazing figure in this field. And what, she's done some math about carbon and forests. And what she's showing in this figure is that um, currently tropical forests account for about 8% of greenhouse, of carbon dioxide emissions globally. And when you take into account um, not only just deforestation but also places where uh, there, there's been um, disturbance of forests, that number actually goes up to be between 16 and 19%. But there's also an opportunity here, right, because I showed you a lot of our forests are gone. So if we were able to reforest areas that, that have, are currently out of, out of forest now, um, you can actually sequester a lot of additional carbon, and that's because uh, wood grows on trees and wood is made of carbon. Right? So there's actually a huge opportunity here. If we were to um, re reduce tropical deforestation and degradation and help forests to regrow in areas where they're cleared, we could actually be... Um, this is the mitigation potential from those activities is between 25 and 30 percent of our total global emissions. And this is a really interesting um, and uh, I would say both optimistic and, and hopeful number. So how are we going to do that? Well, there's been a lot of different conversations about how do we, um, how do we conserve and restore forests. There's been a, a fair bit of pushback against the idea of protected areas, which, uh, you know, several decades ago there was a lot of talk about we just have to lock forests up, make sure that nobody goes in them. Um, that has worked to varying degrees in, in different places. It's had a lot of impacts on local people, a lot of them negative, some of them positive. Um, but because they haven't really worked as well as we wanted, there's been a lot of movement in recent years to engage people in managing their forests. And that's both communities and also at the individual level, individual landholders. And so over the past uh, decade, we've seen a lot of governments devolving control of, of, of government forests to communities. Um, and we've also seen a lot of engagement with private landholders as well uh, to try and, and, and improve their forest management practices. Um, so, oh, sorry, I'll go to I'll do this slide. This is a, this is a slide from um, Nepal where you see um, young women working in a community forest there to, uh, to identify medicinal plants. 
And Nepal is a really interesting case where you have, um, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the forests in that country have been given over to community control. And so we're watching Nepal to see how well this is working in different places and, and how we can learn from those examples. Um, so the panel today is, is really going to talk more about these community, um, in, in this community engagement. How can we work with communities to help them manage their forests in a way that both works for them um, and also produces benefits that will allow them to keep working in these, in these forests over time and sustain them, you know, both, both as a financial side, there's also a cultural element to this. Is this the type of work that they want to be doing? Is it the type of work that they find fulfilling? Is it the type of work that they're willing to stay in a remote community to do, right? Um, so, so that's going to be, we're going to see a couple of different um, models of community-based forestry. One from Peter Pinchot, who's going to talk about his long-term work with communities in Ecuador, um, harvesting many different species of tropical timbers, including species that we don't, that we don't usually use, and um, how you market those. Uh, Lee Fox will be talking about a case from Uganda where he's engaging young people in uh, replanting in tree plantations and, and actually um, has helped a lot of young people go to school with the money that they've made through this type of work. Thais from the FAO is going to be Skyping in to this session and she's going to talk a lot about um, a network called Sustainable Wood for a Sustainable World, which aims to engage uh, local and indigenous communities in the production of, of wood and how do we create the supply chains and the value chains that allow that to happen. And Leslie Parker, who's going to be talking about the real network, um, which is a, a network that also aims to engage people with nature, and hers is going to be a very philosophical talk about how and why we do this and what it looks like. So with that, um, I am just, I just have to say also that I am so thrilled to be here with this panel. I've had the pleasure of working uh, working with many of them, attending conferences that they've organized, seeing them speak, and it's just, it's just a really amazing group of people. Um, and so with that, I'm going to hand the floor over to Peter Pinchot, who is the CEO of Whole Forest Incorporated, and he has been doing, as I mentioned, a lot of really long-term engagement with, uh, with forestry and communities in northwest Ecuador, actually just right down the, the mountainside from where I did my PhD and where I was showing you those pictures of before. So, Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, I got to turn this on. Thank you very much. You've uh, set us all up really well. So um, I've been working in Ecuador for for 15 years, going in the, addressing the issue of, of rapid deforestation in Ecuador's coastal plain, uh, which is one of the most endangered forests in South America. And uh, we work with forest communities that are living in, in the watershed, and we've created a vertically integrated forest products company that's evolved over the years to create strong benefits for the communities uh, that we're working with. And now if I figure out how to use this, I will advance the slide. So we've just gotten the word that our target that we were aiming for for the last five years is not quite strong enough and that we have to even do a better job of reducing carbon emissions than we thought, and that's a tall order. So I want to talk in this presentation about how we make the connection between green building and tropical forest conservation. I think there's a real opportunity there. About 40% of global emissions we know comes from buildings, and we just heard a higher number that I've got here that when you add up tropical deforestation and forest degradation, it's 12 to 16% of the total emissions. So we know that there, our challenge is to, to create scalable business models which can, can drive the transition to a low carbon economy. And there's a, a big opportunity, I think, in connecting uh, tropical forest management and green building. So we, we know about this curve that we've made tremendous progress in green building and dropping the operating energy, but not so much on the embodied energy. And we heard yesterday about the role of mass timber in in displacing high carbon materials like steel and concrete. We also have that kind of a, a um, very strong possibility with tropical forests. Not all tropical forests are being managed well, but if we're talking about community forestry and we're talking about forests right in the midst of deforestation, if we can put those forests under long-term sustainable management and produce wood products that go into green buildings, we have a possibility of of addressing the embodied energy in a different way, which I'll explain. 
This is something I think, Sarah, you were uh, alluding to uh, without mentioning it, but there was a very important paper that came out last year, late in the year, Nature, Natural Climate Solutions, which went into how by managing vegetation we can get ahead of the curve on dropping uh, uh, carbon emissions while we're waiting to get the, the political uh, ability to do it through uh, international and national uh, laws. So reforestation uh, has the potential to mitigate or, or to bind up carbon three gigatons per year uh, avoided deforestation, another three gigatons per year. Improved forest management of native forest, another gigaton a year. That means roughly seven gigatons uh, of carbon, which when you think we're doing 40 something, is a major piece of the whole, whole puzzle of how we're gonna uh, get to uh, addressing, uh, mitigating the climate change. So this is a, a, from that same paper, showing that if you, that you have a lot of political resistance to addressing fossil fuel emissions, but not very much resistance on the forestry emissions. And in the next 10 years, we have the possibility to bend the curve down while we're still putting together the, the political will to, to uh, address carbon emissions and on fossil fuel. If you look at the, the remaining uh, tropical forests, there's about 250 gigatons of carbon in, in those forests, and as Sarah noted, uh, the Amazon, the Congo, and Southeast Asia are where the really high carbon forests are. So this is where we work in Ecuador. Uh, in the, uh, we're working in one of the last remnants of the coastal rainforest, the Choco region. All that is in white on that, uh, to the left of, of Ecuador was part of the Choco forest. So we're dealing with about 5% of the forest remaining. And this is the area where we operate in the extreme northern area of, of the north of uh, the coastal plain. Uh, very close to Colombia. The green is the primary forest. The yellow is heavily degraded forest. Most of the carbon's going out of that. A lot of the biodiversity has been driven out of those forests, and whatever is white has been converted to agriculture. It's important to understand that deforestation happens over a 10 to 20 year period of time when the, all the pressure is in that particular area. It's not happening everywhere. It's happening in the, in the agricultural frontier. We work in a hundred, uh, about a 50,000 hectare area with three communities with about 500 families. The drivers of deforestation are roads being punched into big blocks of forest. This one is coming into the area where we're uh, working since 2015. We're working very hard to stop that road. That opens up the market for, for timber management. That also opens up the market for agriculture. So you get illegal logging and then the conversion to agriculture. And in our area, African oil palm is, is the most profitable form of agriculture. Forest communities are the, at the center of whether we can save tropical forests or not. If you can't benefit the forest communities who live in the forest, the forest is gonna disappear. It's gonna go to, once that agricultural opportunity is there, it's gonna go to agriculture. Founders are of this business were in the, the upper left-hand corner. To the top right are our shareholders 10 years later. They're very aggressive. These are community shareholders, and they're very aggressive about how we manage the, the business for their interest, and our employees on the bottom. We got 65 community employees uh, working in the business. So our whole proposition is to reinvent the tropical forestry uh, supply chain to create a strong conservation incentive. And we had to, to essentially there's no knowledge base for how to do that with, with really complex tropical forests. So over the last 10 years, we in, in invested in R&D, in taxonomy, in silviculture, in low impact timber harvest with portable sawmills, not a wood miser, but, a, a, but a similar, and, and, and cable extraction. So the, we do not put any roads in the forest. Our, our conservation management in, in this area is based on several partnerships. We are a Red Plus implementation project with the Ecuadorian government under their Red Plus action plan. Red Plus, by the way, is reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, and the plus means you're doing it with communities with large community benefit. So we have two NGO partners as well in the red polygons and the green polygons that are doing private reserves. We're working in that uh, pink area, and, and then we contract, uh, which is our own property we purchased, and then we're contracting with local families to, to do 20-year uh, leases with us where we, we pay them every year a certain lease payment. 
And this is essentially a, a ground up bio, uh, bio reserve, biosphere reserve. We're not working with the UN on this. This is just how we're operating the same model with a matrix of sustainable forestry around the, the, uh, the reserve network. Um, over 300 species in our forest, and five of them are connected to commercial markets that have any real value. This is typical of tropical forests. That's about 2% of the biomass in that forest is connected to markets. You cannot do good sustainable forestry commercially with that kind of a, a, a market base. So what we did is we said, okay, we're gonna look, we're gonna harvest ecologically what we, we can harvest. And that's about 60 species that have good regeneration. And we're going to make our products uh, out of the, all those species. And we're not gonna sell individual species, we're gonna sell tones and colors and, and, and the aesthetics of mixes of species. So we do flooring, countertops, tables, cutting boards, a lot of different kind of products. Okay, so hmm, that's not, all right, uh, this is not actually my final version, so that's fine. I'm getting very close. So biodiversity is an, a major issue. We, are, we have many globally critically endangered species in the forest we operate, so managing for biodiversity is central to how we manage the forest. And the key part of this is the incentives for the, the communities is actually is, is the center of how we do conservation. We have 65 community employees. They are now earning about $8,500 per year, which in Ecuador puts them in the lower end of the middle class. Uh, we are leasing from families uh, which, with $50 a hectare per year, which gives families who put their, their forest into the, the system uh, another $2,000 per year in, in uh, forest revenues. And so these are essential the, the, to creating the kind of economic benefits for the, the communities. On the other side is what is our value proposition for our clients? When you purchase our products, that purchase is driving conservation. We can't do the conservation without the revenues that come in from sales. So if you put a floor into a building that's using the wood from our project, you're directly conserving the amount of, of hectares that that floor was sourced from. We cut very few trees, so a 1,200 f square foot floor, for instance, for instance, we source from a half of a hectare. A half a hectare has 150 tons of carbon in it. So if what we're looking at, and we don't quite know how we're gonna do it yet, yes, I'm one sentence away, uh, <laughs> we don't quite know how we're gonna make this, the, the actual offering, but we can tie that carbon benefit to directly to uh, whatever product we sell, and that we believe can go to offset some of the embodied energies that are going on in buildings. So that's what we do. It's a little safer. Thank you so much for that, Peter. So now I'd like to um, welcome Lee Fox. Lee Fox is a professional tree planter and also the founder. And I'm going to I'm going to give you this title. Oh, I was sitting here. But the founder and director. Oh, that's okay. I'll sit here. No, because not right, the other person's not here. What? The other person uh, is not here. Yeah, yeah. Who's going to speak to us about engaging um, youth and forestry in in Uganda? Okay, thank you, Sarah, and hello, everybody. Uh, Sarah kind of stole my thunder a little bit. One of my favorite things about coming to events like this is sitting in front of uh, an audience and, and telling people that I am a professional tree planter, self-identify, and watch to see how many smiles come out uh, in the room as you uh, go through perceptions of what a, uh, a young tree planter from Canada is, is all about. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm one of the founders of a company called Fair Trade Carbon Uganda. I've been working in Uganda for about 13 years now, and this started with my tree planting money. I went there on a contract with UBC to set up a house for 
interns and volunteers, finished that contract, saw a opportunity for forestry, and I think at that time I was about six years into the business, and I also saw a bunch of kids that couldn't afford to go to school, and they were being sent home at high school in grade eight and grade nine because they couldn't afford the 40 bucks a term that it cost to go to school. So I took that home and started planting and started thinking, you know, what can I do about this? I had done an undergrad or was in an undergrad in um, political science, international development focus, and wondering how do you do something that's sustainable? How do you uh, um, make an impact and engage you? Um, but something that's not, I'm not Bill Gates. I can't sponsor every kid in this village or in Uganda. Um, so what I'd like to do here today is talk about um, a project that I'm involved in with Sarah and Scott called The Future of Forest Work. And it's uh, just very quickly, it's out of the University of Saskatchewan and Flair out of University of Michigan. And it's a series of visioning workshops with youth around the world. And so we had nine countries and 14 workshops and I was the Africa facilitator. And we did two in Uganda and I went down to Tanzania and did one there as well. So the idea is talking to youth about what their perceptions are of their own future, what are the opportunities, what um, do they see themselves doing in three, five, ten years from now, and how does that uh, factor into what's happening in their communities. And so there was a, a structured methodology that we went through, and this was a documentary video that we made of the one workshop in Luanunda. So I'm going to let this run, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing with some of the workshop participants as a next step in joint venture business uh, in forestry or in community. today called the future of forest work and we talked about this in the information session but this is a group from Uganda and there are groups from countries all over the world doing the same thing so you guys are working with people from Ecuador from Mexico from Brazil from Nepal uh, to talk about these things and look at what your views are on forestry on work in your community and uh, what the future of that looks like these are the sorts of things that we're going to be talking to youth about today and co-creating. You know, what are their ideas for the future? The idea of this is for youth to be able to express their ideas and share those with youth in other countries. Uh, we have basically targeted youth and we are looking at an age group of 15 to 20, 25. Basically, Mr. Lee and the friends have always been targeting youth people who are still energetic and would love to have an opportunity to study, perhaps. First thing, we're going to brainstorm uh, some ideas about the community, and then we're going to make an itinerary of places we're going to stop, and we're going to draw a map. Uh, remove betting companies. Ye <laughs> here for 12 years now and uh, we've been engaged at village level forestry the whole time. Uh, I'm a tree planter from Canada and uh, came here, started a tree planting company, started employing youth that couldn't afford to go to school and basically providing job opportunities for people at the village level here. I'm gonna show you the eucalyptus plant and within 12 to 15 years it can be used for timber 
that is for both furniture and building. It, it has so many purposes. We get those things that I've told you. We even earn money because those timber and electric poles, they are sold. And a middle size of a tree of 15 years can cost like 1050,000 Ugandan shillings. That is equivalent to $50. basically looking at job opportunities for the youth in the future, uh, jobs that they can create, jobs that they can easily do to get school fees, to earn a living, to be able to sustain themselves, and the opportunities for the tree planting business. Tuvade Tuina Omsomo Wano Ku Chitengisa Comprehensive Community Library, Ngagubade Ku Stingdua for na kubiri gweta bidwa mwa bavubuka abenja ulo okuva mu community ya Feno nga tuwanyiganya kubilowozo okumo butonde bwensi engeli yitusobola okubuzaawo engeli je tuwanyiganya mu bilowozo okuli emirimu eja ejenja ulo nga omuli okusomesa okusomesa abantu kunkwatagana ye bilime ebintu emiti jona Hadi naziwa ni Rwanda kula ibrali, nga wali wo omusomo, guwana kubiri, na hizo kusimbe miti. Hiranga nsobolo kutandi kusimbe miti, wejikula, nengisala ni mfuna msendi. Enyambie okubanga ne kiririzaamu nti nja asolo bere echo chenso chenja galo okubera tekomye kunjigiriza bibya kusimba miti joka abule mfunye mu kusomesebwa ne mbulamu bwa bulijjo ebintu byensobolo okola nga netandikira wa kalimo from what i've seen in the uh, the workshop people have been engaged they've been interested in it um, are they looking for the next step and looking for investment in their projects? Are they looking for work? Absolutely. And I think it's a, it's a huge need in communities like this to look at where do the jobs come from, but hopefully give them a little bit of, uh, um, you know, things to think about in terms of I want to go into this business, what do I need to think about? Um, what are some of the potential uh, upsides for forestry? And it's, it's youth and students and kids like this that you need to engage in preserving forests, but also taking an interest in earning some money from forests. Okay. So I know that I only have a couple minutes left here, so I have a one slide deck. That's Janet. She's our nursery manager and is one of the, uh, was one of the participants, you may recognize her from the pink dress, uh, talking about the eucalyptus. So Janet is characteristic of many of the 60 youth that we worked with in this workshop and one of the things that we had to do was brainstorm business ideas. And everybody had a lot of energy about that and they really had lots of ideas about things that they could do in their community to do forest conservation or big business. You saw them talking about a pig business and things like that. And one of the, the biggest barriers is access to capital. And so of the 20 participants in the workshop, zero would qualify for a loan from anywhere, from a microfinance, from anything. They have no security. And even if they had security to get a loan, uh, the interest rates and fees in Uganda are between 45 and 90 percent per year. So if your business misses on one cycle on anything, uh, you're done, you lose your land. And many farmers lose their land because of that. And so when I first started in 2005, um, I was, I'm going to date myself here, I think I was 26 or 27, 
and uh, I didn't have money to buy a bunch of land. And so we started a model of joint venture partnerships with local farmers where they retain ownership of their land. Uh, we do all the capital costs to invest and convert to forestry and now we're 50-50 partners in it. And so coming out of this workshop, we had 20, and 20 kids that were uh, in each workshop that were talking to us about, okay, well, what do we do next? How do we, like, let's get this going. Is there money from this program? Or, and I'm, I'm very upfront about where, when or when there is not money involved. And so with Janet and her friend Susan, who are our nursery managers at one of our shops, um, we started talking about this concept of five additional income sources and saying, like, you don't want to be dependent on me and your wages as your only source of income. So what are five small businesses we can do? And we came up with this model where we started small. So vegetables was the first one, and uh, growing vegetable starts. And so Janet and Susan did a budget and planned out how they're going to grow cabbages and watermelons and tomatoes that were in the pots ready to go for people to come buy for five cents or ten cents and things like that. And I did some work with them, you know, teaching on how to set up a spreadsheet and how to track costs and, and do that. And uh, when I came back to Uganda this last time, I just landed in September this year, um, they had envelopes for me. And it had like a, you know a, a bunch of dirty bills and change and things that had come in from the village. And they said, "Here's your uh, investment money back. Here's your 50% of the profit, and here's the accounting for all of it." And you know that made me pretty happy to see them do that on their own. And the next round was already going. And so we've done that now with vegetables with them. Uh, we've done that with uh, tree seedlings. And so I have uh, a, a bunch of hats that I wear, but we've got a group of um, Aboriginal uh, interns or, uh, uh, from Canada that are working for us in Uganda as part of a Global Affairs Canada grant that we got in partnership with BC First Nations Forestry Council and the Jane Goodall Institute. And so as a learning exercise, I did uh, work with Janet and Susan for uh, about three weeks to put together a proposal to do a chicken coop for growing chickens for meat. So this is the next level of investment. The first one was around $200, that $100 that I had to put in. This is now more at the 1200 to 1400 Canadian to grow two to 300 chickens at a time for sale on, in local markets. And so coaching with Janet and Susan, they did a whole business plan and then presented to these six interns that are there as potential investors. And it was a great kind of co-learning type of thing. And uh, one of the, the, the cultural clashes, I guess you could say, that happened when they mapped out how big, you know, the pen for chickens is about the size of this stage, and all of the Canadian interns were horrified that that many chickens were going to be packed into that small a space, and they said, no, we need double that. And, and so then it was Janet and Susan saying, well, that's going to increase our, our construction costs. What do, we, what do we do about that? And I said, well, if you want foreign direct investment from people in Canada, these are the things that you're going to have to balance. And the same sort of thing to the interns saying, this is, how they, this is a lot of space for chickens, and this is how it's done. And so bringing those sort of things together and working on this concept of village direct investment, where um, so Janet has a plan to um, establish the operation, and she's going to pay 500,000 shillings per round back to the shareholders. And Janet and Susan own 50%, and all of the rest of us in it own 8.5% of a chicken operation in Uganda. And uh, so that's something that we're going to go through. And um, you know, we've got a contingency fund, and they have it all planned out on how, uh, how that's going to work. And so we're looking at these models and engaging with the other facilitators that were at this Future Forest Work workshop we were one of the only ones that had an enterprise plan to follow um, the youth workshop, but very similar things in uh, Bolivia, Ecuador, Nepal. Um, youth have a lot of energy for this sort of thing, and they lack access to capital, training, things like that. And so we're trying to bridge some of those things. Uh, we don't charge 45% interest, we charge zero interest, and we are equity partners in it instead of just the bank to loan them money. So we're coaching it along the way and uh, you know, we're interested in their success. And uh, I came back from Uganda three days ago, I left the group of interns and everybody working there. We're into the tree planting season, we're pineapple farmers now, we just bought 100 acres and we're setting up a pineapple farm and looking at how to, um, how to empower people like Janet 
to take control of their own lives. Don't be dependent on, on me as a foreigner with your wage or anything else. Um, you can do this for yourself. And it was a pretty cool talk I had with the two of them before I left. And uh, so we're looking to take this and incubate it a little bit and then spread it out to other places. And uh, so in terms of connections, I know I'm probably out of time here, but um, definitely get in touch with me if, if you connect with any of this in any way or uh, are interested in learning more about how we've run our company in the last 13 years and how this sort of thing is what's going to make a huge difference in uh, people's lives in forest communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, and I just wanted to say that uh, with, with this project and this network, one of our next steps will be actually going in and supporting some of these business ideas that the youth came up with. So that's a, something, a whole, whole other conversation, but uh, you can talk to, obviously, Lee, myself, Scott, about that later if, you have, if you're interested. Um, Okay, so our third presentation is from Thais Lynn Harris Juvenal, who is the team leader of forest governance and economics at the uh, Food and Agricultural Association of the United Nations, otherwise known as the FAO. Um, and she's going to be speaking with us about um, an initiative called Sustainable Wood for Sustainable World. And this is a, this is a, a, a group that she has, um, she has started and Scott was invited to participate in uh, their meeting last fall in Rome right after our third Wood at Work conference. So we're really excited to hear from her and, and hear some of the, the thoughts and findings from that network. So is everything? Um, yeah, everything is good. Perfect. Can you, can you hear us, Thais? Yes. Excellent. Um, we're just getting your your uh, mics lifted up. Just give us a minute. Thais, can you test uh, your microphone? Yes, can you hear me? Where's the speaker? Speaker's right here. How is that? No, we will hear her, not that. Okay. Thais, can you, can, you can you test for us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, go ahead. Great. So, I assume you don't have a presentation I have to share with you, isn't it? Uh, you, can, you can share on your screen. You the screen share, Thais? Um, otherwise, we don't have it loaded separately. You're on the big screen for us here. Okay. So, if you're, <laughs> if you're able to um, toggle between your screen, we can look at some of your slides. Okay. Otherwise, it's just you. Okay, I'm just trying to share it. I'm not really sure. I manage um, because right now what you see is FAO, isn't it? So can you see something coming from me now? No. No, we just see you right now, Thais. There, there you go. go. Oh. There we go. It, yeah, there you go. Got it. Got it. But. Please tell me whether you have your presentation, the presentation now? The presentation's up, Thais. You're good to go. Yeah. Oh, great. Good. <laughs> okay, so uh, good, I believe, good morning, Sue. Yes. For you? Yeah. So thank you very much for inviting me for participating of this meeting. Really, thank you, Scott. And, uh, um, I would like to say that the presentation that I'm going to make here today is probably not really new for you. I think that this audience from the previous presentations uh, is already uh, 
completely into the topic of the need of working with uh, with forests, with forests in tropical areas, if you want to to keep them standing. So use of forests, if it's sustainable use, and if you want build capacities for this sustainable use, uh, is something that is fundamental to deliver the social economic benefits from forests that can allow people to value forests and keep them standing. And, and this is the assumption of what I'm going to discuss here with you today. We initiated this uh, movement that has become a formal initiative under the Collaborative Partnership on Forests, that is the Sustainable Wood for a Sustainable World. And as the title of my presentation suggests, this initiative is very much about doing capacity building on better governance, better production, better in, uh, uh, inclusiveness of forest value chains, but it's also about bringing back the positive role of sustainable wood to the international agenda. Because we understand that there is a need to recognize that wood is not only a driver of forest predation or forest uh, or, or deforestation, but wood is also a, an important and perhaps the, at the moment at least the most valuable asset that a forest can offer to, its, to, to their communities and therefore uh, it's important that we find a way to balance the benefits from wood uh, with the need uh, of conservation and, uh, uh, and, for, and fighting forest degradation and biodiversity. And we know that we have available technologies, we have knowledge, we have you know, scientific data that tells that this is possible. What we need is really to work with these communities to work with uh, uh, those engaged in the forest value chains to make this happen. So, after this quite long introduction, I will start my presentation preaching to the converted, so showing you something that is not at all new. But we have a violin. A violin is made of wood, made of some special wood, some of this wood coming from tropical countries. We had an event here in FAO in July where we had a Amazonian FSC certified violin with a beautiful, beautiful song, sound. So wood is music. Wood is also art. Not only this beautiful art from the Art Biennale from uh, Venice Arena last year, but also um, is starting now in constructions. I'm speaking to an audience of architects and doing a lot of art, uh, and functional art with wood. Wood is also the low, the low carbon reality, and we know that more than wood buildings can represent up to 75% of emission reductions. We have evidence from all over the world. Um, in Japan, they have seen that one cubic meter of wood leads to an emission reduction of about 38% when used in replacement of steel reinforced concrete in three-story buildings. This is one, of, one type of evidence that we have. And we are now making efforts to bring more effort to more evidence to, to calculate the carbon storage function of, of forest wood products. And in this regard, wood is fundamental to the, to the, to the challenge of sustainable cities um, and the substitution effect to accelerate climate change mitigation. But wood is also the energy of the poor. When we go to Africa, when we go to when we go to Africa, when we go to uh, um, Asia, but in particular in Africa, uh, we have uh, wood fuel is consumed by approximately 2.4 billion people. 
um, for cooking meals, sterilizing water, and heating homes. So it means that wood is also responsible indirectly for food security because if the people could not access this wood fuel, they would not uh, have uh, access to uh, food. It's also clean energy and fuels. We know we have a massive, we can have massive uh, production of bioenergy from wood, not only through uh, uh, um, burning, you know, uh, uh, forest, uh, uh, planted forest, but also uh, through the most advanced wave of wood-derived liquid fuels, such as the tall oil. Wood is innovation, as I mentioned, not only the tall oil, that, you know, the very downstream uh, innovative product from wood, but also the CLT that has been used a lot of the increasing new increasing use in uh, construction. But the negative image of wood is there, not for a reason. So we see here something published last year. Most wood energy schemes are a disaster for climate change. And sometimes the most alarming news are not exactly what is behind the scientific study. So the scientific study is actually highlighting the need to assess impacts of use of bioenergy before declaring them, before declaring bioenergy something that is, uh, uh, is contribute to mitigation. And we all know that. But the thing is that the negative image of wood has had a much more impact. And of course, I'm being naive here not to recognize that has been a lot of bad practice that has uh, uh, created this uh, 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 collective uh, engineering, of, imaginering of wood, of wood always linked to deforestation, in particular, if wood from developing countries, but not only because in the northern countries, you also have all the issues related to uh, the use of wood associated to uh, uh, reduction of, uh, of biodiversity and potentially reduction of also uh, agricultural fields, which is not exactly. So we need to change that because we actually know that if forests are sustainably managed, it can provide a number of contributions for achieving the SDGs. And if you look to this picture, you can see all sorts of contributions, of positive contributions, that can be derived from wood value chains, from sustainable wood value chains. And if you put the emphasis on sustainable, and if you leave things as they are now, we still will have a lot of unsustainable wood in the market. We will still have a lot of unsustainable wood being consumed by forest communities, by the world, markets that are not that uh, uh, strict. And we will never be able to value the sustainable wood that can generate all these contributions that we see here. So, Cash and kind, income, wood fuel, women, women employment. We know that many of the wood value chains, they really uh, represent uh, uh, a very important for women leadership. Watershed production, protection, uh, water cycle, you know, protection of forests uh, 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 and its relationship with uh, uh, the water systems. Biomass energy, employment in rural and urban areas, you know, reduction of informality, innovation, the role of small and medium enterprise. You know that in forest chains we have at least 75% of production in forestry is connected, is, 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 is generated by uh, SMEs. Resilient infrastructure, sustainable wood products, and the sustainable cities, mitigation and adaptation, as I, managed, as I mentioned. So, this connection between conservation, sustainable forest management for wood and also for non wood products, 
and they need those plantations for sustainable plantations for restoration and, produ and production. Those are the key rings that we need to put together to have sustainability and to connect this and to establish the nexus between uh, sustainable rural and urban landscapes. So, Thais, what if you can see our, our timekeeping, we just about another minute or two left. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. So, what we did is that we create. We are aiming to create this global coalition to promote sustainable wood products' role in achieving the SDGs and climate change commitments, raising awareness of this nexus between sustainable forest management and the bioeconomy, and as I said, the sustainable rural environments as well. So the initiative is working already, and we are working on the raise, raising awareness part of the availability of sustainable wood products. We understand that there is a, a, a the market does not know how to identify sustainable sources uh, of wood, dispel the negative perception uh, of wood production that affects the good production and the bad, not only the bad, unlock markets and finance for sustainable wood, which is also a, a, a problem, build capacity for strengthening the sustainable value chains, and show how, when, where wood contributes to sustainable bioeconomy. And through these actions, we'll be exploring these linkages between forest management, landscapes, value chains, livelihoods, markets, investments, and financing mechanisms. So what are we doing? We are seeking alignment with other initiatives and projects that have the same concerns as us. We are seeking higher level profile of sustainable wood value chains, and we are uh, fundraising for work at policy, technical, and operational level to make sure that we can have uh, uh, stronger uh, uh, for, uh, wood value chains, sustainable wood value chains present globally and not only in northern countries. So, wood is good, and I thank all of you for that. So promoting the benefits of sustainable wood. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Thais. Um, and now we have a Leslie Parker with, um, we're switching gears a little bit here um, in terms of our, of our scale and again, a little bit our geography. Um, but Leslie Parker is the founder and director of The Real Network, which is um, an interdisciplinary group of people who, uh, sorry, sustainability and climate uh, experts founded in 2002. And um, Scott had the, uh, was able to attend their, their last conference, which was held in the, in the beautiful mountains above um, the city of Oslo in Norway, which is an incredible setting for the conversation. And um, Leslie will be giving us a philosophical perspective on how, how uh, we engage with nature and, and some of the reasons for it and, and why. And so I will leave it to her to take it from here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leslie. Yeah, no, I'm going to use the podium. Uh, before I actually start my talk, I, I do, no? You cannot hear me? Sorry. Okay, uh, so so I, I, I guess I better. Uh, you want to do that? I'm gonna um, close it. Close it. So I do want to say while I'm being adjusted here that um, that um, real. Two of the work streams we're doing, one is mainstreaming Pope Francis's Laudato Si, even though we're an entirely secular group of policy experts, we're mainstreaming Laudato Si, and we are also, Real also so fully believes and is committed to this idea that timber new build can be an absolutely unparalleled opportunity 
to restore degraded lands, address climate change, and also Oh God. <laughs> and also to um, address ecological justice issues, provide meaningful work, which is, you know, one of the really truly distressing things about our society is how people simply don't have meaningful work anymore. So timber new build is just something we want to embrace for all the positive aspects that com can come out of it. So. Um, and the other, one of our other work streams is um, mainstreaming the Laudato Sea. So as I'm putting myself together before I start my talk, I'm just curious how many people in this room have actually read Pope Francis's encyclical letter, the Laudato Sea on care for our common home? Wait, one, two, three, four. So that's, uh, so for those of you who have not read it, I'll be referring to it a lot. Pope Francis is, for reasons that will become more clear as I go through my talk, is a fantastic ally to every single person in this room. And so the more, and he's also helped keep this conversation current and spread it. So um, if anybody has the chance, it's a small book. It's frankly riveting once you start. But I guess I better get to my talk, which I'm actually going to have to read. And I do have, um, if I have time at the end, okay, you can officially start me now. If I have time at the end, I will go back to this fantastic Durer engraving, which actually technically isn't part of my talk. But I'm just gonna, it's so beautiful. <laughs> I'm going to, and it's philosophical and spiritual. I'm going to uh, describe it at, the, uh, at, at some other point. But I, let me just leave it up as I start my talk, okay. So I want to say, and now, even though you were forewarned, and now for something completely different, for those of you who are old enough to know what that reference is to, um, I want to open by thanking Scott and Sarah so much for their truly great work, and I am just so honored to be here, and, and the work of other people in this room. Wood at work, those three words say it all. Wood, too, has a purpose and wants to be of service. In the Western Aristotelian tradition, the four elements are earth, air, fire, and water. But, in Daois, but Taoism recognizes the status of wood as one of the building blocks and one of the guiding principles of the universe. The five elements in the Taoist tradition are fire, earth, water, metal, and wood. This panel is about global partnerships, but rather than talk about partnerships between people, I am going to talk about partnership, the thrilling partnership between humans and trees. This talk will really be a absolutely historical, philosophical, and art historical interlude. You're going to feel like you're back in college. <laughs> and and it will be about concepts drawn from Pope Francis's 2015 encyclical Laudato Si on care of our common home, which are relevant to the architect's building in wood. I'm going to cross the brook quickly, skipping from stone to stone, hoping not to stumble, but I'm sure I'll stumble along the way. My remarks today are about, about trees are about this story. Trees, connection, collaboration, design, redemption. All spiritual and cultural traditions have the concept of the tree as a bearer of meaning beyond the material plane. All of us in this room, whether we articulate it or not, perceive and understand the supernatural and supramundane elements of trees. When you protect trees and work with trees, you are protecting these spiritual aspects, aspects which have a powerful determining role on the planet and society, the mystical tree. The 19th century uh, American naturalist John Muir said, between every two pines is a door to another world. All cultures have the concept of the sacred grove, connection, but connection to the divine is only one service trees provide. In fact, trees only serve, that's all they do, shade, shelter, sustenance, beauty, and wonder not to mention cleaning our air, water, providing medicine, healing, and a beneficent climate and breath. 
In this way, trees teach the spiritual lesson of service. There are two sides of our relationships to trees. They serve us spiritually, but also materially. They must be conserved, but they must be used. Humans have always had this twofold relationship to trees. The question is how to balance it for our mutual be benefit. We do not seem to be getting it right. Even in the earlier surviving piece of literature from 2100 BC, the Epic of Gilgamesh, is a story about a leader who went to the sacred cedar grove to slay the guardian of the grove, Humbaba the Terrible. And he prevailed, the human prevailed, and he cut down the entire grove. Our collaboration with trees must be guided by our sense of connection to them. And this brings me finally to the Laudato Sea. Two guiding tenets of the Laudato Sea are that society and environment deteriorate together and that we have mutually reinforcing obligations to each other and to nature. One of the amazing things the Pope has done is to help wake us up to this view of the world, the view that we are all brothers and sisters. I, I guess, does everybody in this room know that Pope Francis specifically took his name because he wanted to signal that he wanted to emulate St. Francis in Fr St. Francis's view of our connection to nature? And in fact, the very opening lines of the Laudato Si are from St. Francis's canticle praising nature. Laudato Si, brother son who brings the day, beautiful and radiant in all his splendor. Sister moon and the stars, clear and precious and beautiful. Sister water, useful and humble and precious and pure. Laudato Si, brother fire, fire, playful, robust, and strong. This luminous reality of the quote, I quote from the Laudato Si, the mysterious relationship of things is at the heart of the Laudato Si. The book of nature is one in indivisible, or one of my favorite phrasings of the Pope is, he speaks of any number of constant and secretly interwoven relationships that make up the universe. We are all connected to all creatures and each other, whether we see it or not. But it is better to see it because then we see the way forward. And so this idea of connection to all of nature brings me to the American transcendental tradition, so I will just read one quote from Emerson's 1836 essay, Nature. This is Emerson. The greatest delight which the fields and woods minister is the suggestion of an occult relation between man and the vegetable. I am not alone and unacknowledged. They nod to me and I to them. The waving of the boughs in the storm is new to me and old. It takes me by surprise, and yet it is not unknown. But our relationship, I think everybody will acknowledge, and the Pope does not pull his punches at all in the Laudato Si. Famously, an off-quoted line of his is he says, the world is beginning, uh-oh. OK. Um, so let me read the Pope's uh, version of our dysfunction, and then I'm going to race through the slides. Um, Pope Francis describes the dysfunction. Men and women have constantly intervened in nature, but for a long time, but for a long time, this meant being in tune and respecting the possibilities offered by the things themselves. It was a matter of receiving what nature herself allowed, as if from its own hand. Now, by contrast, we are the ones to lay our hands on things, attempting to extract everything possible from them while frequently ignoring or forgetting the reality in front of us. Human beings and material objects no longer extend a friendly hand to one another. The relationship has become confrontational. So all of us in this room are trying to get the relationship back to collaborative and mutual. So what I'll do instead of reading anymore, although I must read the uh, final two quote, uh, poems, is I'm going to go to just skip to the next slide. Oh, wait, I have to do that. Sorry. So do people recognize this 1848 painting of, by Carl Spitzweg? So this demonstrates the concern that the Europeans had over industrialization. Here we see a gnome sadly and wistfully gazing off in, into the distance at a train. People in Europe in mid-century were very worried about how, how technology was distancing us from nature. Um, and in fact, Ruskin also 
in answer to industrialization, started the arts and crafts movement because, as he said, you can make a tool of the creature or a man of him. You cannot make him both. Okay, so it always amazes me there is nothing new under the sun and human beings are always developing technology and then becoming aghast at the, like, at the results of the technology. And so in another time of great technological change due to radio, here you have, do, does anybody recognize this building? Oh, so wait, the New Yorker must recognize this building. This is, this is the lintel and sculpture at 32, at 30 Rockefeller Center, which is Radio Center, R Radio City. So you see Radio City then, Silicon Valley now, it's the same story. But it's interesting that at least the architects and designers of Radio City made the statement which they took from Isaiah, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. We are getting it wrong in the balance. We are too much towards technocratic. We, are, we, we have replaced philosophy with ideology. So for you uh, architects in the room, the, the, the lintel from 30 Rockefeller Center is actually based on this famous engraving 1794 by William Blake, The Ancient of Days. Here is God as a designer. And now, wait a minute, okay. So God as a designer brings me to my second to last quotation. So we have been discussing the necessity of wisdom. This poem, this image by Blake is based actually on Proverbs 8 where wisdom speaks. And she says, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. So I want to go back to nature. I will, um, one part of the talk was about design, biomimicry, the wisdom inherent in nature, but we all know this and have discussed it today. So I will go to my very last slide, which is going back to the mystical tree. All spiritualities and religions have their version of it. But the, um, this is a fourth century church. It's a mosaic from 1200, which was during the life of St. Francis. And this, of course, is the Christian version of the Tree of Life. And so I'm going to end with the book, the, the passage in Revelation, which is the basis of this mosaic. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations. Thank you. <laughs>
Are you asking? I'm asking all of you. So this is a question to the panel. Anyone who'd like to answer? Hopefully all of you. I'll, I'll take a, a shot at it. So when you're dealing with, with uh, community forestry, A, you're dealing with a lot of species which are not in the, in the supply chain. B, you're dealing with uh, more craft-like uh, production than you would have in, in the highest quality uh, CNC kind of uh, facility that we, we get a lot of our wood in. So um, they're, they're not necessarily, you can't easily go into engineered specification structural members. You're talking more on, on surface materials that where the, the craft, handcraftedness of it and the, the different kind of species evoke an emotional state. And so in a sense, that's what you're doing. You have the emotional state of the connection to the community and you have the, the emotional state of, of the way that the wood is presented. And I don't think we're ever gonna get to the point where community forests are, are doing absolutely state-of-the-art high-tech uh, processing. I would say scale is one of the biggest challenges. You want to have decentralized production and small communities or small groups or target populations that are doing the growing or processing and things like that. But then how do you bring it together for a global market and make it financially viable to be shipping for, in our case, down to Mombasa and out to the world from there? Um, isolation of indigenous communities. I think the, uh, uh, the FAO as part of their food security uh, set of indicators talks about percentage of paved roads over total roads and so how do you get your stuff to market and you know for us in the Canadian industry I work on the coast in BC and there are business models for using a helicopter that costs sixteen thousand dollars an hour to pull wood off the hill and then we are the small part of that and they fly us back into plant trees and our bills are in the tens of thousands just for transport of seedlings and tree planters. Um, you think about that in an indigenous community, even if you are in a tropical rainforest, how do you get that wood out and how do you engage people in getting uh, a piece of that? And then even in, in Canada, if you look at the three major stakeholders in any area, and speaking particularly about BC, you've got the government, you've got the timber companies, and you've got First Nations. And uh, I've been working with a, a young indigenous lawyer um, that's working for me in Africa right now. And just looking at the numbers, if uh, a block or a series of blocks is harvested and the gross revenue to the timber company is $5 million, the government might get 500 grand uh, of that as stumpage and the payout to the First Nation is $30,000 as a standard payment, not as a percentage based. And so I think that looking at where, how you value that and where, you know, where the, what, what should that percentage be to venture into a normative? Like, is, is that equitable? And starting to look at, um, I know for traditional knowledge in First Nations, it's a thousand year management plan. And that's, that's how they've traditionally managed for us. And the way the industry's going is, uh, from 90 years presently to 50 years, because that's where the sawmill technology is. They want smaller timber, faster turnovers, and so these are these are challenges that come face to face for sure. Um, just for a higher level answer, we, we did a one of our meetings on the Ladalto Sea was actually at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, and we have a, a summary. And one of the points that was brought up there was that the wisdom of indigenous peoples needs to permeate our very atomized Western culture. And I would say, yeah, thank you, <laughs> it's amazing, and, and again, the Pope, who my group is entirely secular, but we think there is a lot of wisdom in the Pope, and the Pope has really supported indigenous communities. So to go to the answer specifically, I would say simply raising consciousness of indigenous peoples, pe you know, their, their worldview, they, they are spiritually connected to the forest. The idea that you can manage policy and finance of nature without a true sense of connection to nature is frankly ludicrous. 
And so I would say a, um, a, a, uh, an obstacle would be more people need to be aware of indigenous peoples, their relationship to nature, and their very critical role in guiding us to managing nature. Can I just follow up on, the, on that point? Because in, Ecuador has done something very unusual involving the indigenous people in forming its constitution in 2007. And the Ecuadorian constitution now endows nature independent of people of having rights. All environmental services in Ecuador belong to nature. They don't belong to the landowner. They don't belong to the government. They belong to nature itself. So that's when you start seeing this kind of a principle come in, into play. Although, I just, just to add to that, this is very strange. I only learned this two years ago, so somebody could validate this. But I understand that actually the Swiss, I think, have a pretty mystical view of nature. And I understand that in the Swiss constitution, in their Bill of Rights, that plants have rights according to the Swiss government. Well, that's good. Is, is there a way for um, Thais to answer? Thais? Thais, are you with us? Do you have, have, you, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I would leave it for now. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank I you. So do you have a question for Thais? No, no, I was just going to add one more um, sort of comment there that, that we're operating in a business reality that is very corporate. And the corporations, and this is happening in BC right now, the corporations, uh, for the sake of profit and their own interests, don't want to recognize traditional knowledge. They don't want to incorporate that. And so I think it's, it's while you're, you're right that raising consciousness is important, they're well aware of that and they're employing strategies on how not to do that. So the language of a requirement to, to do a consultation, that's, that's all it says in the regulation is that you're required to consult. And so they'll put a spreadsheet together saying we had five community meetings and this is what was talked about and there's nothing about um, profit sharing or how it should be percentage based versus a lump sum cash payment. So when the cedar market triples in BC and the companies are tripling their gross revenue, um, the indigenous communities are still getting that $30,000 payment. And um, so how to, you know, there's, there's policy implications, there's business implications, but how to, um, I guess, understand who you're engaging with and what their interests are. And if it needs to be mandated, then mandate it. But I don't think that, you know, waiting for corporations or certain um, um, stakeholders to come to it by themselves and, uh, and sort of grow a heart and say, well, you know, you're right. You should be looking at it at longer term management plans, even though it's going to be more expensive for us, even though that's going to cut into our profits. But that's the whole point of creating a benign cycle. If more people's consciousness are raised, they can push back on business. We can't go forward with business as usual. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I, I absolutely agree with you. But I, you know, know who you're sitting across the table from, and they will tell you, yes, absolutely, we are. Uh, like, look on all their websites, the corporate, corporate social responsibility stuff, and safety. Um, you know, I, I've worked for the safest company in the forest industry, and almost fell out of a helicopter when the pad collapsed on me. Um, and I was dangling off the side because they had done their safety checks and you know but they've got drug testing and they've got all the safety things in place and they cover their bases on a legal side of it but at the end of the day I almost and my whole crew almost got killed because they didn't check to make sure that the pads were safe. So this is a fascinating conversation, <laughs> and I really, I really hate to cut it off, but I think our lunch... Is it dramatic? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just end with um, helicopter crashes. One, and one thought that occurred to me when you were answering this question was that one of the things that, um, that Scott and I have worked a lot on, and many people in this room have as well, is, is thinking about how to set up relationships where people who want wood can interact directly with communities who are providing wood and, and how we can you know, make that something that's, that's both um, feasible but also really benefits both parties. So that's, uh, I think that's a really, the, the conversation here with, with some of the challenges also leads to that point of, of you can connect directly with people who are producing the wood that, that helps to 
um, helps to avoid some of that in a certain way. The coffee that we are drinking today actually comes from a, a roastery that, that does that with, um, it's actually bird-friendly coffee, so they, they go into the forest and they actually do habitat assessments of the forest to make sure it's suitable for birds, and they do this with individual farms and communities, and, and, and the, they, they source the coffee and then they provide it to us. So uh, we're serving their coffee because it's an inspiration for that kind of relationship. So, um, Scott, I believe you're up here because we're out of time. I'm uh, just that we can all smell the food. Um, it's ready for us. Um, so let's, let's continue this conversation over lunch. And I mean, just I have to say one word of connection between this panel and, and our keynote last night. And I just think it's so interesting to kind of figure out like the direction that things are moving in terms of technology and um, quantification. And then to, to continually remind ourselves that we have to ask these other more difficult questions. So, Let's let that be one of the topics over lunch. Um, there's probably a few other um, housekeeping things. Just, um, come on out. Oh, okay. Hey, just, just one note that I don't think the caterer brought any uh, drinks. So I guess we could encourage you to, there's cups and glasses, go to the uh, water fountain. Okay, do we have a, do we have a water um, cooler there? Okay. So we will be bringing drinks out. Um, so enjoy the lunch. We're going to be back here at, what's the time check? It should be 1.30. And uh, there was a round table concept put out for the Cities for Forests uh, folks. Is there anyone um, interested in, in just doing a kind of informal lunch round table on the Cities for Forests concept? The main idea of lunch is to, to you know, have these conversations. There's some tables that you can use out in the lobby area. Um, there's also a large table here. You can bring a few chairs up if you want to sit down at this table. Um, we ask that you don't roam freely in the school. Please do not do that. But the whole lobby area here um, is, is um, fair game. And there's some seats and stools out there. So um, enjoy the wonderful lunch. Find Sarah or myself or Mac or some of the student helpers if you have specific questions. And um, we will see everyone back here at 1.30 for the next panel.